This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It is three minutes after ten, and I confess I hadn't heard that phrase until that particular news bulletin, the the, the Goldilocks option, because at first glance, if you woke up to news this morning of Israel's attack upon Iran, you may have thought that Benjamin Netanyahu had elected to ignore international calls for restraint. And yet, as the the dust settled, both both metaphorical and actual, um, it became clear that perhaps he had this Goldilocks option, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, And, you know, you start processing that thought and and the Iranian authorities, official state media in in Iran, which is essentially uh, a a mouthpiece for the Ayatollahs, uh, confirming or at least claiming that the damage has been minimal, that, that so far as we know, no lives have been lost, and the ordinance deployed was not particularly apocalyptic. So you've got an attack upon Israel, which hurt nobody, I beg your pardon, as a critically ill young Bedouin girl and, and, and others critically injured. But if you think about the scale of the carnage in Gaza or the horror of the October the 7th terror attack upon Israel, then, you know, a, a death toll of zero is at first glance a thing to celebrate. And at second glance, a thing to celebrate, two death tolls. But then, and forgive me if this is a strange way to approach this scenario, and then you just look at the madness of it all. I, I mean, what an absolutely absurd scenario. We might as well be back in the 12th century with trebuchets and catapults. I, I, the, 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 the purposes that are being served by these twin attacks... Have you any idea what they are? Well, we've got to show that we're tough. We've got to show that we won't put up with it. We can't not respond because that will... I mean, it is, it's is—it's the politics of the playground. I wouldn't say that, I don't think, if people had been killed in their droves, in, in, this, in this twin exchange, because it would feel so inappropriate. But my goodness me, what a, what a, what a, what a weird... I don't say species, nearly. Like, what a weird world we are. Two things have happened that I thought we should talk about. The first is the retaliat- retaliatory strikes after weeks of escalating tensions. Um, uh, uh, US officials say Israel hit Iran with a missile overnight on Friday, competing claims about the scale of the attack on the Isfahan region. But the consensus seems to be with the Iranian state media downplaying its significance. The consensus seems to be that if Netanyahu was going to do something, this is about the best that people could have hoped for. I beg your pardon. I'm sure there are people in Israel and beyond who wish he had gone further. So let me say instead, this is the best that those of us who mourn every death equally, whether it's a Palestinian child, an Iranian child, an Israeli child, a Muslim child or a Jewish child, This is probably the best we could have hoped for if Netanyahu had to do something, okay? How do you describe it? Andrew has already been in touch to call it face-saving stone-throwing. And that applies equally to both of them, doesn't it? It's it's, 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 such a strange state of affairs that genuine fears, probably the most plausible or credible fears of a World War III-type scenario has been delivered by two regimes that are currently engaged in what I think can be loosely described as (laughs) face-saving stone throwing or face-saving missile launching. Um, it, 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 It sits alongside another story that I think understandably is drawing a little less attention. And that is something that happened in Washington, at the UN Security Council, where a draft resolution was put before members recommending that, and I quote, the state of Palestine be admitted to membership of the United Nations. Now, it's a 15-member Security Council, as you know. There were 12 votes in favour and two abstentions. Uh, uh, The power of veto exercised by the US meant that the motion went nowhere. But my goodness me, it leaves America incredibly isolated now on the world stage in their support for 
Israel, or rather their opposition to Palestinian statehood, which is regarded as an act of support for Israel. So there's a little bit of me that wonders how looking at that UN security resolution vote, Netanyahu has managed in the space of six months to segue from the sympathy of the entire world, certainly the sympathy of the entire Western world, to actually having allies such as France vote against his express wishes. Uh, uh, you know, that is, I think, a, 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 an interesting development, but not, of course, as important in the short term as Israel launching missiles, launching an attack on Iran. So... Ivan suggests it's handbags at dawn. Well, it, it, it is, and Kathy calls it willy-waving, which I think we'll allow one mention of on the programme. And it kind of is, isn't it? It's, it's such a strange feeling this morning to be having a conversation with such enormous ramifications, but with currently no actual casualties, or at least no actual killing. It's good old-fashioned brinksmanship, says Lewis. And I think that's what we'll do today, unless you come up with a better idea. I think we'll look at what what is going on. What is this? Two very, very military powers have launched attacks upon each other that journalists and diplomats have chosen to describe in fairly apocalyptic language. Uh, well, at least the, the word unprecedented has been bandied around a lot. The international community has been almost unanimous in calls for Netanyahu not to retaliate. And yet there is a sense at 10 past 10, and it might have changed by 11 o'clock, there is a sense at 10 past 10 that somehow this retaliation is okay because it hasn't really achieved anything tangible. Which leads us to the question of what has it done that is intangible. I don't think, as things stand, there are any reports of crucial infrastructure having been damaged. Similarly, the 300 plus uh, projectiles that were launched upon Israel don't seem to have uh, sustained any meaningful infrastructural damage, with the exception of the, uh, the Bedouin people living in uh, a, a, a sort of borderline shantytown situation being injured and, and please god that they're all right that the casualty count seems to be mercifully low low to, to to non-existent if we're talking about deaths and i have absolutely no idea what's been achieved and yet i have a sense because i'm not stupid i hope that something has what oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three what has been achieved? So, someone's made a lot of money. Every time a bomb goes off, every time a missile's launched, every time a drone takes to the sky, whether it gets shot down or not, there's a, there's a shareholding somewhere that ticks up. Like the more I've, I've read about arms supplies in both world wars, the more my faith in humanity has diminished but but there's always there's always a few quid being made i don't think it, 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 it's a particularly important factor in this conversation but goodness me it's important not to forget it what what has been achieved oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need we are sitting here worried about a world war three scenario because we have been told by Everybody important to be a bit worried, at least, about a World War Three scenario. We are reading reports, the like of which we haven't really read before, about Iran launching 300-plus projectiles, missiles, toward drones towards Israel, on Israel, at Israel, breaching some of their, well, 99.9%, over 99% of them I read yesterday have been shot down. And now Israel responds with an action that appears at first glance to be in contravention of what their allies were calling for. And they achieve about as little as Iran achieved in the first place. And the world is sort of responding, I think, with a sense of relief that Benjamin Netanyahu didn't go further 
And yet what he has done since October the 7th is enough to ensure absolute isolation at the UN Security Council, save for the continuing support of Joe Biden, who has arguably been made to look a little bit of a mug by Netanyahu's refusal to respect his requests for no retaliation. So, look, the simplistic question here, and occasionally it's worth asking the simplistic question, is whether or not this Goldilocks option is the, 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 the least bad outcome of the current standoff. Uh, an attack that didn't really hurt anybody is a good thing. And that's the point at which I feel this is all a bit Kafkaesque. Don't, I don't know if you'd looked at it this way round before I started burbling. But, oh, great, yes, there's been a massive attack and no one got hurt. It's like something out of Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, isn't it? Um, so what has been achieved? Nothing tangible. Normally, you judge the success of a mission like this, I think, by counting the, the, the casualties, counting the enemy casualties or um, counting the cost of, of the damage sustained. Or they won't be able to do this or that airport will not be usable or um, that, that senior military figure has been removed from the, from the chessboard. That's how you normally calculate the success of these sort of things. And yet here we are um, celebrating the... I don't want to even say failure, but the but the but the but the logistical fact. I mean, it, it, it can't be a failure because I don't think they were trying to do any more than what they've done. So I think that we can probably agree. And if the situation changes in the course of this morning, I, I will of course uh, bring it to your attention and possibly change my question accordingly. But the notion of no tangible impact no significant measurable impact of either the Iranian attack upon Israel or the Israeli attack upon Iran, what is the intangible impact? What are the intangible effects, the, the, the unmeasurable consequences of both of these excursions? If you hit the numbers now, you will get through. Uh, sometimes at 10 o'clock, I don't really know where we're going when, when, when we start talking. I do my best to get across the facts. And I'm, I'm grateful to you for indulging me this morning because I really struggled with that notion of this all looking a little bit surreal. I hate stepping too far back from a story when it's a matter of life and death. I don't know who else just suddenly thought of the Tory ex or suspended Tory MP Mark Menzies when I used that phrase, life and death. But because the casualty count is, is is low to non-existent overnight and yet the significance of what has happened is dominating international news and diplomacy it just struck me as being a moment perhaps to remark upon the the the, the strangeness of it all and that led us i think um helpfully towards the question of what's been achieved by both sides, what have Iran achieved and what have Israel achieved? Or rather, what have Iran and Israel achieved in the last week? 0345 6060 973. It's 1017. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 10, Iranian state TV reporting that three drones were destroyed over the city of Isfahan. A, a, a strange sense abroad that the I, I mean, someone else has pointed out rather cleverly that people are calling it de-escalatory. So some, and that's the perfect distillation of, of I, I don't like the word surreal. I used to love it, but it gets overused so much. But, but this, uh, someone rather winningly has got a Twitter account called Contempt for the Conmen. I wonder where they got that from. Uh, but the, the notion that an attack, an escalatory attack can somehow be de-escalatory sums up absolutely perfectly what I was, what I was trying to convey. How, how can a, a military engagement? How can the launch of an as yet unspecified number of missiles constitute de-escalation? And yet, I think somehow it does. So we can't count the tangibles. What are the intangibles? Tab is in Lambeth to kick things off. Tab, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, mate. Really nice to talk to you. Likewise. First time caller. Welcome aboard. Um, so. <clears throat> I'm going to try and be as articulate as you always are. Um, well, let's not I, get carried away. Let's not get carried away, Tab. <laughs> uh, 
frankly, I don't think it's achieving anything tangible or intangible apart from, I guess, a continuation of the the constant animosity on both sides, which I think is kind of part of the plan. Really. Well, then, well, but then the 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 the, 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 the negligible casualty count speaks against you, doesn't it? If it did, be... isn't it the only way that you know the world is rightly upset about all the killing yes. on both sides, yes. and we can we can debate the causes and all of that. And, sure. But I think most uh, neutral people will say pretty awful stuff has happened on both sides. Stop! Now. Stop killing each uh, other. Exactly. And so, but the problem is, is I think what this whole recent event since October the 7th have kind of um, shown is that the world is perhaps taking this stuff a little bit more seriously. There's a bit more of a dividing line showing. You talked about France now, Mm. maybe not standing with America. Um, And that's not good for anyone. It's certainly not good for business. Um, And I don't think we as the West or whoever you want to say the UN don't really have a plan. Um, and the lack of a plan means we just need to keep going, don't we? We need to keep the, the, the same animosity on both sides. It makes us a lot of money. It keeps people in power. And so how can we do that without really upsetting the people that are starting to get very, very, frankly, pissed off? Um, you just, know, just no, what, no what, interest what, in language, all of this stuff. What, what, What's your language slightly? Apologies. No, that's, apologies, that, that's all right. Apologies. You'd already You'd already kind of lost me a bit, but then you dragged me back in again. So... I think you're well. If you look at the UN Security Council votes, it, it, the, the 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 massive majority of members, two abstentions notwithstanding, fourteen members failed to vote against um, a, a bid for full membership for for the Palestinian people. So, if as I think you're arguing that the status quo suits the vested interests, if it don't want to sound too conspiratorial, true, that, that then you just mean America now and Israel. I think also just if we can say that both sides are kind of attacking each other and it's no one's dying, we can start to forget a little bit Um, because one thing we can say that's happened, as I say, in all of this last few months is that people are taking it seriously. We've been sleepwalking, haven't we, for the last... 70, however many hundreds of years about this, these issues. I don't know that um, we have. I, I, I mean, the, 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 certainly focus has narrowed since October the 7th. And yes. it is significant, I think, that Netanyahu's tactics have alienated a lot of historic allies, both both on the political and indeed on the personal level. And, you know, when Chuck Schumer starts talking about Israel being a, being a pariah, you know that the tectonic plates have shifted. But do the events of the last week shift them back at all? I'll tell you what I don't know. What, what happens if they resume or step up hostilities in Gaza? Would the, would the conversation have changed at all as a consequence of these two of this exchange of missiles? Well, that's it. I don't think it has. No. I think all it would have done is that say that, you know what, even if people say they're angry, um, Iran, whoever, um, it doesn't really lead to so much. It's, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of blade sharpening exercise you've got two people being held back by their mates and and what's happened over the last week is that they've both been flexing their muscles and sharpening their knives and showing everybody that they if push comes to shove they mean business and they've got what it takes to to do more i think so but i also think in terms of the the language we're calling this an escalation well, right. hey, we're, we're calling it, mate. We're calling it a de escalatory escalation in the last well, 12 well, hours. Exactly. That, I mean, what an oxymoron it is. Well, yes, itself, no, I right? don't, but, but we're humans, not robots. Oxymorons can somehow, sometimes sure. encapsulate difficult and complicated issues. It's because it, it, it's, if, it, if, you know, if he'd gone absolutely full on in a response, which some people feared he would then that would be escalatory. So it's a, it's considerably less escalatory than the other thing he could have done, and therefore it's de, de-escalatory. So what do we know today that we didn't know a week ago? That some drones from Iran can reach Israel and they can knock them down. That, 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 that might be, yeah. Well, that's tangible. To... That, that's tangible. And, and I, probably the capability of Israel of, of, of bringing... Um, uh, 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 bringing the fight to Iran was already pretty well established. I, I'm not. I'm not the. It's not something I'm a, a confident to pontificate upon whether or not that, that there were some elements of the Iranian assault that would have given 
genuine pause or surprise to, to um, Israel in particular and the international community in general. Thank you, Tab. Jawad is in Birmingham. Jawad, what's changed? What's been achieved? Uh, hi, James. Oh. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I guess you could reiterate the point that, that your previous caller made that, um, first of all, you, you've proven that these uh, ballistic missiles can actually reach um, Israel. So I think I think that's a, certainly a point. That Did you, we not know that? that? We, we may have known that in theory, but in practice, we've now know, we now oh, know okay. that three hundred yep. times over. So, so, so that a, so yes, and and even though the Iron Dome was uh, uh, almost completely successful in mm. wiping them out, of course, if ten times more had been launched, the consequences yep. may have been terrible. You, we also have to acknowledge the fact that, um, and this applies to the drones that the Houthis are actually. Uh, deploying as well, that they cost on average between 2000 to $20,000 a piece, which is pennies when it comes to this sort of warfare. Yes, it is. So, yeah. Why do we have to yeah. bear that in mind? Sorry. I, I because, it, because to overwhelm the, the Iron Dome, uh, it, it's quite cheap. So it would be feasible. To, it would be feasible, yeah. Uh, and that's, the, that, I mean, to put it in crude terms... That is because of the time it takes to reload, if you pardon the, the, the simplicity and the crudity. So the Iron Dome is a brilliant, brilliant piece of kit, but yep. um, you, you could overwhelm it with volume, yep. perhaps. And, 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 your, and, your, and your, your, your viewers can actually perhaps look this up and, and confirm my, my source, but I read somewhere in a newspaper, Israeli newspaper, that there was this piece of research done um, to show that it would take about a, four or five days' worth of successive um, attacks on Israel to completely deplete the Iron Dome. And at Gosh. that point, beyond that, it would be uh, open fire uh, on, on, on Israel. So I think that, um, and that's from, from various angles here. Okay, um, well, pe people, know, people can check that, me included. I, I've got no reason to doubt it. I, it. It rings a vague bell with me as well. But how then does Netanyahu's decision over the last 24 hours fit in either to this narrative or, or make sense more generally? Well, uh, in terms of what decision are we speaking about? He, well, the decision he, to launch an, an, a, a velvet glove, shall we say, possibly an iron fist in a velvet glove, but, but the, the, the damage done to Iran, as far as we can tell, hmm. is minimal. Yeah, well, this is why my, my actual point that I wanted to make, and I don't mean to make the point as much as plant the seed yeah. um, but maybe it's important to look at the relationship between Iran and Israel a little bit more closely. Um, and I have been doing that. I'm a Sunni Muslim in Britain. Yes. But I'm, my, my opinion is not very popular, even within Sunni circles, because there's a lot of support from my community for the uh, Shia Iran, Iran. regime. Yes. Um, and, you know, in Britain, we don't feel that difference because we're friends across the spectrum, sure. especially with the, the current generation. There's, there's no political or religious divide that we sense in the West, and that's my personal experience. But on a political level, and in, 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 in a his, from a historical standpoint, I think we have to look at that relationship a little bit closer and see who the common enemies are for Israel and who the common enemies have been historically for Iran. Um, if you recall, uh, there's videos of um, Netanyahu making speeches in the U.S. Congress about um, uh, Saddam Hussein being a target, a potential enemy for, for the West, uh, Gaddafi being a potential enemy for the West. Um, a lot of the, the people, a lot of the leaders, the Arab leaders, the Sunni leaders that Netanyahu has actually um, uh, spoken of in yeah. the U.S. Congress have have also been um, agitators for the Iran regime, particularly Gaddafi, who actually, prior to the revolution, um, he he singled out um, the Shah uh, for for having positive relations with Israel. Right. Um, so I think there are there is something beyond uh, the media and beyond this spectacle. You'd, you'd slightly. Um, I, I don't think you're speaking in code, but we are a little bit short of time. Are, are yep. you suggesting that Israel? That Israeli and Iranian regimes at this point have a bit more common ground than perhaps we realise. Absolutely, and, I, and okay. I'm, I'm, I think when when perhaps documents as in my enemy's enemy is my friend, sort of territory. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've that's interesting. That I had to keep that in. No, in and, and, and and we brought it in bang on time as well. Thank you for that. I, I food for thought. It's one of those days, and and I know that people are still dying, and I, I, I know there are some stories so hard, of course, when uh, BBC and other news organisations can't really get in 
to the Gaza Strip. But but if we're talking, and it's a little bit naive perhaps to do this, but s- exclusively within the, within the parameters of these two international attacks, then you can be a little bit more philosophical than previously because the casualty count, the consequences have been have not been bloody so far. Half past ten is the time. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.32. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I like this. I'm going to nick this, actually. I like it so much. In fact, I wish I hadn't already given away the fact that someone else has sent it in. I could have passed it off as my own undetected. Sick notes of the new small boats. It's even got the um, felicitousness of rhyming, hasn't it? Sick notes of the new small boats. Uh, Rishi Sunak this morning doing... I think you'll let me say this. I'm not claiming I'm the only one or that I've possessed of any sort of um, uh, uh, clairvoyant abilities. But I did tell you in terms and repeatedly that the that the next big thing to come from this ludicrous government would be an attack upon people being signed off work sick and that it wouldn't, when they came to do it, address any of the plausible reasons why these numbers are rocketing. For example, long waiting lists, meaning that people are getting sicker while waiting to be treated. Uh, For example, uh, uh, supply chain issues regarding medication, meaning that people who could work can't work because they can't get the medication as reliably or indeed in the the quantities that they need, something that we talked about yesterday. Stress levels increasing because of the cost of living, mental health suffering as a consequence of people living much more precarious lives, whether it's because their mortgages have gone up or whether it's because the... uh, um, uh, a simple business of keeping the wolf from the door has become close to impossible. All of these are reasons why the number of people being signed off work sick uh, has risen exponentially in recent years. And all of these are at least in large part a consequence of policies that Rishi Sunak has been fully supportive of. So after 11 o'clock this morning, we will address the frankly ridiculous spectacle of a government responsible for rendering its own population sicker than ever before, now turning its attention on the sick. In in much the same way that when their own members are found to have broken rules and even perhaps laws, but certainly rules, they change the rules. They don't punish the members, they change the rules. And that does actually apply to small boats, which Ken Clark, that well-known lefty and uh, titan of the Labour movement, Ken Clark, the former Tory Chancellor, has described the attempts to redefine the word unsafe as safe as akin to arguing that a cat is actually a dog. But again, I probably won't hear this analysis as, uh, uh, as clearly as you deserve from um, organs that remain committed to everything from Brexit to Rishi Sunak's premiership. And speaking of things that you probably haven't heard as much as you should have done, it has been reported in, in Gaza two days ago, in fact, uh, a few of you keen that I mentioned this, and I'm happy to, that at least 11 people, including children, um, have been killed in an Israeli attack on the Maghazi refugee camp in central Gaza. The the Wafa news agency, the Palestinian Wafa news agency, reported that the strike hit a playground frequently visited by displaced children. Um, Several people wounded in the attack and most of those killed reportedly children. Now, this isn't a conversation for today, but you, 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 you immediately... I catch myself now immediately going, well, of course, we can't be 100% sure. And that undermines all of the reports coming out of Gaza. Really, the first line of all of this should be Western media can't get in because Israel won't let them. And that, that I'm, I'm sorry, that is just the pivotal point in all of this coverage. Oh, you can't trust the figures coming out because the Hamas run the Palestinian Health Authority. Fine. You're perfectly entitled to that opinion. Can we send in some people that we can trust? No. All right, can we have a frank and open conversation about the methods that the Palestinian Health Authority uses to conduct its death toll? The, the detail they provide of the people that they believe that, no, we can't really have that conversation either because they're, they're Hamas-backed, so you can't trust them. Well, can we send in some people that we can trust? No, you can't do that either. So I have to say, as I read this, that the Palestinian Wafa News Agency is not an organisation whose provenance I know much about. Um, the only British outlet I've seen report it, and this is probably just a failure of my search engine, is is The National, the, the, the Scottish newspaper, The National. And yet, you know, we're having a conversation almost celebrating the fact that nobody got killed in Iran overnight. And we haven't had a conversation about an Israeli airstrike on a playground reportedly leaving 11 children dead. 
1036 is the time. Back to the question of what has been achieved in the last two days. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need to contribute. It's been a, a pretty powerful start um, and, and long may it continue. Matt is in Hull. Matt, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, yeah, um, I think <clears throat> with the Iranian attack, uh, what that achieved that it is a huge shift in the region is that they proved that they can penetrate the Iron Dome and they didn't even use their latest and most sophisticated weapons. They, they used up old kits. So you, you send drones first to, to mop up the missiles that are launched to shoot them down. Drones are very cheap. Mm. Yeah, they reckon Israel launched $1.3 billion worth of missiles to largely shoot down two $3,000 drones. You know, and, and they were able to strike two airfields, one of which is the most defended location on the planet. Um, and they did it with old kit and a relatively small scale attack because it, 300 sounds like a lot, but it's not when you think that 185 of those were drones just sacrificed, like sacrificing pawn to the chess game. And, and they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're certainly the cheaper ones, not a million miles away from something you could pick up in Argos. Yeah, you can buy them in droves from, from anywhere and just slight modifications and you've got a, a drone that you can attach a small explosive to so you can't ignore them because they might hit something. If you ignore do them, you feel but, do you feel this is being under appreciated in, in, in some of the coverage the the, the, the yeah. significance of what Iran demonstrated has been if not missed then underreported it, it was a very well planned and, and you know they gave 72 hours notice through the Saudis to the US and to to Israel that that was what they were going to do that this, these are the targets we're going to go for the four so there were two intelligence bases and two airfields both of which were involved in the attack on well, the they, continent. They, they, they were reached rather than struck, weren't they? They were hit. They were definitely hit. But not to a point of being put out of commission or anything no, like because, that. No, because that would have escalated in a way that would have been... You know, I mean, the, the Iranians don't want to drag themselves into a regional war. The Americans don't want to be dragged into a regional war. So you know, a lot of diplomacy goes on in the background that, that we're not told of about course, you know, cause it's of course. secret and all those communications are going on constantly between uh so william burns is is currently in, was in saudi arabia when he's the head of the cia sorry yes uh was in saudi arabia uh negotiating with israeli delegates saying look if you respond massively to the iranian attack uh you know that's going to be an unacceptable escalation so they kind of bargaining over We'll let you go and have a, a limited attack into uh, Rafa if you don't respond overwhelmingly or, or you know, provocatively to the Iranian attack. And uh, I say, if you listen to people like Larry Johnson, who's former CIA, yeah. or Phil Giraldi, or um, Chaz Freeman, who's a sort of very eminent diplomat of his generation, you know, they, they're quite happy to talk about all these things going on in the background. But, yeah, Iran was saying, look, all we've done, we haven't swung a punch. We've put our fist up to your nose and shown you, you know, we can breach that system. Uh, so, you know, that... Uh, and so they talk about a thing called an escalatory ladder. Yeah. And an escalatory dominance. That's well, a good Iran phrase. Has shown that's a, that's a good phrase. So they haven't gone up many rungs. Yeah, yeah. But they're on and, the ladder. <laughs> yes. Uh, and Iran has shown for the first time ever that that they kind of dictate the pace. They can breach the Iron Dome whenever they like. And bearing in mind, we had RAF planes, American planes, Jordanian, Jordanian planes helping French. shoot down the drones. Yes. So Israel on its own, yeah, it would have been even well, more. Does that make a, more of a mystery then of the nature of Israel's response? I think Netanyahu's under so much pressure internationally that he hasn't responded at all. Well, that's domestic then. The pressure yeah. is domestic. There's not really any allies saying, please go out there and, and bang some Iranian heads Exactly, together. the opposite. They yes. were saying, you know, don't respond to this. You know, it's only going to cause a... a and, and bearing in mind, you know, the attack on the consulate was the original aggression. I mean, Iran, yes. up to that point, wasn't directly involved. Uh, you know, people talk about Hezbollah and the other things that uh, Iran supplies, but, you know, we supply all kinds of people with weapons and, yes. you know, that's deemed okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... it's so he, he, he didn't... I mean, he, he... So he had to do something, and he's done as little as he could to appease domestic pressure. And, and to not upset the Americans, who, who, who 
told him to be restrained. So he said, look, I did strike back to his local population. Yeah. And he said to the Americans, look, I can exercise restraint. I can. I can. And what's absent from the political landscape in Israel, or at least what is far from prominent, is the voice saying you should have done a lot more. The, 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 the political rival who wants to tack further away from moderation and peace. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... Because he brought well, them into the tent, really, yeah, to the exclusion yeah. of people who may have been less... More, more moderate, yeah. yeah. And, and so a lot of Israelis, quite understandably now, are terrified because the Iron Dome was breached. And, uh, and they have other systems, you know, like David's Sling and things like that. They're all very sophisticated systems, but... Yeah. Yeah. No, you I hear you. you I mean, can I can I ask why? I mean, is your interest just academic? You just find it fascinating because you, 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 we've you, actually spoken before about Trident. My dad used to work, do a lot of work it. with NATO. I remember that. Yes. Of yeah, course. and, and uh, I've <laughs> I can't tell you what my last job was, but okay. uh, I. But there's a I, reason why you sound like you know what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and I still have connections through my dad and also through my former employment. Right. Um. But, yeah, I mean, so the way you beat these systems is you overwhelm them. And you do that with, you know, you can now do that with, like you say, Argos drones. <laughs> yes. Can, and, and you just can't sustain. You know, if they they reckon Iran may have spent between 2 and $3 million total, whereas Israel spent $1.3 billion. Well, there's, there's not a limitless supply of those missiles. You know, they're, they're expensive and they're not easy to get hold of. So... And 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 I guess you know it, among among all of these variables of which that there are even more than we realised before you started talking, Matt. The 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 role that Jordan and and the UK and other allies played in the um, uh, destruction of some of the drones, some of the ordnance that probably should have set off slightly louder alarm bells, shouldn't it? it, it because that speaks to the possibility that Israel alone would not have repelled the attack so successfully or foiled the attack so successfully and it's almost like getting a, a, a bead on a target you don't actually need to destroy it you just need to demonstrate to your enemy that you can reach it and that that is analysis that perhaps has been um uh, uh, not absent but but a little bit muted in, in much of the Western coverage. Speaking of Western coverage, a few of you are telling me that Channel 4 reported that attack upon the playground in the refugee camp that, that reportedly left 11 children dead. Um, I, I haven't been able to find it myself, but but enough of you have, have, have messaged me about it to make me think that it's it's probably true. Thank you, Matt. Um, that, that, that was really, really helpful, but quite chilling, I think, for... From the Israeli perspective, in, in the idea of what is likely to happen next, so is Israel essentially undertaking its actions overnight, in in the hope of sustaining status quo and avoiding escalation, even as Netanyahu's ear is full of voices calling for him for him to do more, and of course that involves ignoring the entreaties from allies to do less. So I I, I think, and I heard Nick Ferrari say something similar this morning. And I, I think that given the options available to him, objective observers should probably chalk the events of the last 10 hours up as the least bad. But Netanyahu has taken the least bad path. But that's for objective observers on the outside. That may not be the least bad path for Israelis. Um probably is for Iranians. It's painting the target, is the phrase, I think, that, that, that they use. Although, I have to confess, I may have got that from video games. It's 10.45. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.49 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where I, th I think we might lighten the tone ever so slightly with, a, with, with one of our regular features. If, you, if you're new to the programme, when I say one of our regular features, what I mean is an idea that I came up with some time ago and really liked... Uh, in fact, liked it to the point of instructing my crack team 
of operatives and supporters to uh, commission specific bespoke radio furniture in the style of a sting, I believe it is called, or even on occasion a jingle. And then having been a right pain in the proverbials about getting that done, I then proceed very quickly to forget about it entirely. And then I get cross with everybody else for not reminding me about the thing that I've forgotten. Um, and then several weeks later, I remember it and briefly resurrect the uh, forgotten feature and intend to keep it as part of the programme for the foreseeable future before promptly forgetting it uh, all again. And the latest uh, phenomenon to fit that category is, as you have probably already worked out for yourself... Unhinged headline! Islamists, the far left and woke are uniting to topple the West. We should start playing... Bingo, shouldn't we? Or, or uh, we should start guessing who it is. It's always one of about five people. It's, it's, it's always someone who gets commissioned to write for The Telegraph. Almost all of the unhinged headlines come from The Telegraph, although I reserve the right to include a couple of others, which means it's almost certainly going to be David Frost, who negotiated the brilliant Brexit deal, which I have more news for you uh, later in the programme. Uh, it could be Nick Timothy, who, of course, was uh, uh, Theresa May's right-hand man when they called that disastrous election, and also in the Home Office for the, for the go-home vans and all the rest of it. It could be Alistair Heath, the editor of the Sunday Telegraph, responsible probably for the craziest and the most unhinged headlines that we have ever seen or indeed covered on unhinged headlines. Um, a couple of other right. There's Alison Pearson, who is a columnist there and something of a of, of an absolute chef's kiss of an unhinged headliner. Um, I mean, unhinged columns as well. And then there are a couple of others sort of nibbling around the edges. There's someone called Sherelle, is it Jacobs, I think? And one I haven't come across before, but he today makes his debut on... Unhinged headline. Because we're going for the double. Someone called Jamie Blackett, who has written, the EU would rather destroy the planet than let Brexit succeed. Let's pause for a minute to think about that. Somebody, and remember the Telegraph is my late father's old newspaper, so there is a bittersweet tinge to these tirades whenever we turn our eyes. That means that someone has been paid by the Daily Telegraph to argue if the headline is be to be believed, and there's no earthly way I'm reading whatever bilges below it, but if the headline is to be believed, somebody is sitting there, stroking their chin, arriving at the conclusion that the European Union would rather see the species of humans go extinct than allow somehow it contains or it retains the power to make sure that Brexit either fails or succeeds. That, so we didn't take back any control whatsoever. The EU can still determine whether Brexit fails or succeeds, but the EU would rather, would rather preside over planetary catastrophe than watch Brexit succeed. And not only did somebody write that, they then filed it to a newspaper where somebody read it and passed it on to somebody to sub-edit and to put a headline above it that fits presumably the text below, although there's no earthly way I'm ever going to read that bilge. And, and uh, in, in that chain of production, nobody stopped and went, hang on a minute, I'm pretty sure the EU would, would rather... I mean, A, they probably don't care that much about whether Brexit fails or succeeds because it's not really a mystery, is it? What's happened will happen and is happening. But I don't really think they want the planet to be destroyed rather than see Brexit. I mean, lads, gather round. We're, we're printing an article here saying that they want, to, they want the planet to be destroyed rather than let Brexit succeed. Yep, that's it. That's what we're printing today. Uh, yeah, right, okay. I think we might actually have a, 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 the, the. Is that the best of the year so far? Can you remember all the other unhinged headlines? I don't suppose anyone keeps a record, do they? And, and my crack team of operatives and, and support staff. No, no. no do we got we, we got a record of un, no nothing. We're going to start today, are we? Oh, great! Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Teamwork, eh? That's the best, isn't it? We're going to start today keeping a record of... And, and that means tomorrow we'll all have forgotten about it again. But at the moment, whoever you are, Jamie Blackett, you are leading, I think, 2024. 
Unhinged headline. Back to the Middle East and the question of, if we can't count the tangibles, what are the intangibles? What, what has been achieved by these twin attacks? First, Iran upon Israel. Second, overnight, Israel upon Iran. Noah is in Wimbledon. Noah, what would you like to say? I would like to take issue with your previous callers. Not many rungs on an escalating ladder. Go on. And on willy waving, which was a nice expression, but I think this is it. Well, well, start, on, start with what you think has happened, if you could, or, or what you think has been achieved. So can I go to the context, which is that to describe 325 missiles, rockets, ballistic missiles as not a major escalation, I think is missing entirely what actually happened a week ago. Uh, this was a direct attack from Iran, which... I think the callers under. were talking more about the, 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 the impact. I mean, I used the word impact 30 times when I was setting up the question. The impact and, of these projectiles, these missiles, these drones, has been, thankfully, with the exception of a, of a, of a little Bedouin girl, I think, of some of her relatives, has been minimal. And, and similarly, Israel, presumably, with a similar level of deliberation, has launched many projectiles back into Iran and as far as we know the impact has been minimal so so that's I, 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 I don't want to say that I can't believe I have to explain this but the conversation when nobody has been killed is incredibly different from what the conversation would be if for example 30,000 people had been killed as they have in Gaza I agree I just think that in this context it's the wrong measure to measure in death and the reason I say that is that Israel is not committed, intending or wanting to annihilate Iran. Yes, I, I listen. I, I mean, we've had this phone in many, many times, Noah, but with the greatest of love and respect, we're not having it today. The question is, what has been achieved? And let's just start what, with uh, overnight. What has Israel so achieved overnight? Israel has stated very clearly, very publicly, we can and we will respond. Yes. And we're choosing not to. And that's, no. that's what Iran did last week. Uh, Iran did it in a very different measure. I don't think that three drones on a military base, which is based well, also, from other... Also, land, also reports that a missile, a missile has landed as well. Yes, three drones against 325. Yeah. That's okay. the proportion. So Israel made so a 1% count, you, we'll, we'll count. response. Yeah, okay. Well, I think... I mean, it's, it's fact, yes. Well, so I don't, no, it's Israel, not yet, of course, because we, we, we're still working out what's happened in Iran and we're relying on Iranian state TV, which is, of course, notoriously unreliable. But you think the crucial point is, is to count the number of, of, of missiles and to... No, no, I think the crucial point is to count proportionality okay. and to count... Well, then we should the probably talk a bit Israel about... Extended. Then we should probably talk a bit about Gaza, shouldn't we? Okay, I, I personally um, okay. don't want to defend Israel's policy. In but no, Gaza. let's talk about proportionality. Can we talk about what message I believe Israel was sending, which is we can respond, we will respond, we're choosing not respond. So, we're so, not trying to kill people, we're not aiming at cities, we aimed at one okay. military base where missiles were fired from. And most importantly, Israel is saying, never again. We will not allow ourselves to be annihilated by a regime that is publicly committed with its axis of resistance to surrounding and destroying 7 million Jews in Israel. So, I, th th they, well, either they've proved that or they haven't proved that. And, and it, you seem to be simultaneously telling me that this is not a very big response, but it's big enough to prove really big things. And I, and I think that's feasible, isn't it? That's plausible. I think it's a smart response. What, what did we learn that we didn't already know? That, first of all, Israel, which was very, in my view, wisely advised by all of its allies, do not escalate. What they've done isn't really an escalation. It's just a message. Yeah, you know, they could have yeah I think that's about left. right. That seems feasible to me. Um, but, but the message is why people use phrases like saber-rattling and, and willy -way. It's a message rather than, a, um, rather than an attack. Well, it was an attack. I don't want to diminish that, you know, sending three, if it is three drones, that's the information I have, is, is an attack. But it was a very, 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 very low-toned response. And if they hadn't otherwise. done it, what would, what would be different about today? 
I think Iran is emboldened. I think the previous caller, who was clearly very well informed, uh, was expressing some opinions, and he was clearly in some military response to say, hey, Iran won. I mean, the fact that I believe three missiles landed um, in Israel and were not blocked out by Iron Dome. The mm. information I have is that 95% of the missiles that Iran sent were not downed in Israeli airspace. They were downed before, by before they American, even before they even got to Israel. American, I suppose. French, Israeli, Jordanians in a coordinated effort. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 I hope I'm not being obtuse. I, I, I think we probably shouldn't have started off with um, uh, objecting about the semantics that previous callers have deployed because I think you're you're largely agreeing with them. Everybody has been on pretty much the same page today, which is that this is more of a, a, a more of a message based exchange than it is an actual. Um, bloody exchange. Everyone's agreed about that. Yeah, it's a psychological, okay. very clear message. Yep. Well, then that's why the language was used earlier, because it's a, it's, a, it's a psychological, very clear message. I'm still not entirely clear what it is, except, of course, that it is, it is a reminder of potential capabilities, and that applies equally to Israel and Iran. And I think that the, um, uh, the, the possibility that we know more about Iran than we did before and and not more about Israel than we did before. Maybe, maybe something that is, uh, um, uh, I don't know, a bit questionable. It's 11 o'clock. James O'Brien on LBC. Oh, four minutes after 11 is the time. OK, how are we going to do this, do you think? Uh, Rishi Sunak has, as predicted some time ago on this programme, but, but far from exclusively, the signs have been there. In fact, the biggest sign was in the Daily Mail the other day, I forgot to tell you, where they sent somebody somewhere uh, to discover loads of young people who are off sick without naming any of them. Uh, and I'm not suggesting for a minute when we have conversations like this that nobody anywhere ever swings the lead. Here is the analogy I like, and I've used it a lot, and I think today it deserves another airing, OK? You cannot have an effective safety net without acknowledging that some people for reasons that will probably elude the rest of us, will will elect to use it as a trampoline or, or will elect to use it as a, as a bed. Okay, so the safety net, we are all on the trapeze. We are all swinging on the trapeze of life. Okay? And below us is a safety net. And because we all get paid or most of us get paid as we swing on the trapeze of life, a few of the pennies that we earn go towards making sure that the safety net both exists and is in good working order. Now, some people hate the safety net. Some people have lived lives of such untrammeled privilege and insulation from the reality that the rest of us understand that they don't think they need one and they don't think they're ever going to land in it. And in fact, some people are rich enough to have their own safety net. So they are up on the highest trapeze, bringing in the largest amounts of money. And they've got bespoke tiny, but they've got bungee ropes tied around their waists called bank accounts. And even if they fall, they are going to be fine. They will never land in the safety net that is right at the bottom of the trapezes the one right at the bottom catches people who would otherwise fall into oblivion now it could be that you've lost your job it could be that you're poorly it could be that you're uh, I, I, well those are the most obvious examples of it that you're temporarily incapacitated there are a million reasons why you might end up in that safety net but if you've got a functioning cerebral cortex you would want it to be adequate you would want it to be up to the job you would like the safety net to be made of something other than the cheapest possible materials uh, you know if we were looking at what you might get fed in a safety net you wouldn't want it to be gruel and, and boiled turnips. Do you see what I mean? So it's absolutely essential that you understand people who have their own safety nets. People like Rishi Sunak, who, especially since his marriage, if not before, absolutely knows that whatever catastrophes before him and his, he will never have to bounce around in the same safety net as plebs like us. If the wheels come off our lives, we only have the welfare state to fall back on. There will be various degrees of delay, but ultimately, if the wheels come off and you haven't got, 
inherited wealth or epic amounts of money, enough to pay for health care, enough to pay all of your bills, enough to sustain the quality of life that you enjoy now, even if your income ends tomorrow, then you will never have to bounce about in the safety net that catches the rest of us. Rishi Sunak is way, way, way up there, swinging around and today taking aim at everybody who's already in the safety net. Think about that for a minute. Think about that analogy. I know I get a bit carried away with my analogies, but that is why you have a vague sense of disgust at what you heard Rishi Sunak say in that news bulletin. It's why he is perhaps the least qualified person in the country, never mind in politics, to take aim at people currently signed off sick. Because he's talking about a safety net he knows he will never need, which means that... A, a moral integrity would involve pausing before taking aim at it. But the Daily Mail will love it. The Daily Mail will love it. The Daily Telegraph will probably love it. And all of the people that told you Boris Johnson was a stand-up guy and Brexit was a brilliant idea and the bankers weren't responsible for the international economic crisis of 2008. It was all the fault of... Uh, um, refugees and 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 I, I I can't even remember unemployed people. They will they will all love it. Kind of run out a road on blaming foreigners for everything. Not least because the uh, the ones we need to come here and work are still not coming here to work, even though the numbers continue to rocket. You can't blame. You can't really blame it on gay people or homeless people. I, you know why is my life a little bit rubbish? I know why. It's that fella over there who I've never met, but who the Daily Mail tell me is claiming all sorts of sickness benefits while being perfectly fit to work. Now stop for a minute and imagine. It was you, right? You were perfectly capable of going to work, but you wanted not to, so you went to the doctor and asked them to sign you off. You'd be dead of boredom in a month. The massive, massive majority of us would be dead of boredom in a month. OK, you've got a mate who knows someone who used to go out with a girl whose dad has been signing on since 1973 and spends his whole life like Stan Ogden in Coronation Street watching the racing on the telly and drinking Tenant Super. OK, he is not a reason to rip up the safety net. He is not a reason to start dropping uh, hand grenades from the trapeze eye that we're swinging on, and I, I don't know that that is the plural, as someone has just texted me to suggest, uh, and, and blow up the whole system or start attacking the people who are currently in need of that safety net. Just because there's a fella over there in a string vest smoking a roll-up who hasn't done a proper day's work since 1973 does not mean that you take aim, as Rishi Sunak is doing today, at everybody, pretty much, who is currently off sick. And they will pretend, oh, no, I don't mean you. So, I mean, it's like a playbook now, isn't it? You can, every single bit of it, oh, I don't mean you. So if, if it's immigrants you're going after and then it succeeds because people vote for Brexit and then you say, hang on a minute, why did you vote for Brexit? Oh, I voted to get rid of all the immigrants. And you say, well, I'm an immigrant. And they go, oh, I don't mean you. So that's what Sunak did in an actual speech today. He essentially said, oh, no, I don't mean you. I don't mean the, the deserving recipients of welfare. I don't mean the deserving uh, recipients of the safety net. I don't mean you. I don't mean the people. I don't mean you. I mean all the other ones. You know, all the other ones like him over there and her at number 44. All the other ones. They're, they're swinging the lead. They're taking the mickey. They don't, they don't need to be off sick. Why might this country currently be suffering from an epidemic of debilitating mental and physical sickness shall we count the ways shall we contemplate a few reasons why the numbers might be rocketing okay let's ignore for the moment the possibility that a generation of people have woken up and decided that living on tuppence halfpenny a week and not doing any work is 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 the dream that is what i'm aiming for that is what i want let's consider the possibility that the consequences of covid remain unmeasured both physical and mental that the damage done to people by that virus and of course by the enforced isolations that it involves has taken an incredible toll upon their physical and mental health that's reason one let's look at reason 
reason two. Reason two, let us say after yesterday's programme, would involve the damage to the supply chains that has been done internationally by everything from COVID to inflation and war in Ukraine, but which is exacerbated enormously in the United Kingdom by, altogether now, Brexit. So would Rishi Sunak mention when decrying the amount of people who can't really go to work because they're not getting the medication they need to go to work safely? We spoke to a man yesterday who can't go upstairs because he hasn't got enough epilepsy medication and he needs to have his shower when his wife is in the room just in case he has a seizure. And the seizures, which were once every one or two months a couple of years ago, are now due to a diminishment in his medication, are now... Um, I think he said two or three a week. So imagine the likelihood of him being able to go to work until the supply chain for his epilepsy medicine is fixed. Do you think that Rishi Sunak would mention that? Of course he wouldn't. He voted for Brexit. He voted to damage the supply chains for medicines that people need in order to be able to go to work. But he didn't mention that. So what have we got? We've got the impacts of recent events in the context of COVID. We've got the damage done to medical supply chains in the context of Brexit. Then do you know what else we've got? We've got the cost of living. We've got the sheer bloody grind of it that millions of people up and down this country are experiencing on, an, on unprecedented levels. You've got people who have had an envelope dropped through their letterbox, partly as a consequence of what Liz Truss did to our economy, that is telling them that their mortgage payments have gone up by 50, 60, 70 percent. And like Mr. McCorber, they live within their means. They live just below the unsustainable and the mortgage goes up or the rent goes up and suddenly they move into the unsustainable. What the hell do you think that does to their mental health? What do you think the thought that however hard I pedal, I'm not going to move does to people, particularly perhaps providers, particularly perhaps parents, people who have played by the rules, who have done their bit, who have kept up their end of the social contract and now can't afford to feed their children. They can turn on their radio and hear a man insult them by claiming that they could feed their kids for 30p and then get promoted by Rishi Sunak to become the deputy chair of the Conservative Party. How do you think they feel? What impact do you think perhaps that fear and misery might have on their mental health? So there's reason number three. We've got the context of recent events, whether it's COVID or, 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 or the consequences. We've got the damage to the supply chain that means people can't get the medicines that would enable them to be able to go to work. We've got the... Um, we need a fourth one, actually. I know what the fourth one is. It's possibly the biggest one of all. We've got the mental strain of the cost of living crisis, a consequence of conservative policy. You've got, number four, the horrors of austerity. You've got the fact that there is no support for you. There is no help. You can't cope with your kid and the Shore Start Centre was shut by David Cameron. The stress of that is such that maybe your husband has to give up work in order to come and look after you or you're caring for an elderly relative because the welfare state, that bit of the safety net has been snipped up and sold off. So you, you, you can't go to work because you've got to look after your mum. Rishi Sunak hasn't uh, addressed your problems, although to be fair, you wouldn't be signed off sick. But I'll tell you who would be signed off sick. Someone on a waiting list, someone who could actually have been treated a year ago and put back into full working order, someone who could have been, uh, you know, dusted down, spruced up and cured or treated or sent to work. But they haven't been because of the waiting lists that Rishi Sunak promised to shorten. What about the doctor who's too stressed to go to work because the terms and conditions are so bloody awful? What about the nurse who can't do it because she hasn't received the counselling she needed as a consequence of having to watch people die on her ward during COVID? They're signed off sick. They're all signed off sick. People on the waiting list are signed off sick. People whose mental health has been brought to the very brink of catastrophe by the cost of living crisis or the consequences of austerity, they're signed off sick. People who can't get their medication because of the supply chain issues voted for by Rishi Sunak. They're signed off sick. All these people are signed off sick. And Rishi Sunak wants to uh, set fire to the safety net. It's not even politics, this. Psychologically disgusting. It really is. And I don't know, really... 
what the best way into it is. I acknowledge the existence, for the avoidance of doubt, of the bloke in the string vest over there smoking a roll-up and living on Tenant Super who hasn't worked since 1973. I acknowledge his existence. But I do not acknowledge the existence of an army of young people who are choosing to opt out of work. The impact upon mental health of all of the things that I've just listed is immense. Absolutely immense. CAMS is overwhelmed. Overwhelmed to the point of absurdity. And guess what? The adult, the young adults and teenagers and children who cannot see a CAMS counsellor for love or money until they've actually attempted suicide, they grow up. The lucky ones grow up. The massive majority grow up and they become adults with mental health issues. They become adults who can't go to work because their employer doesn't understand that there'll be days when they can't leave the house. And Rishi Sunak's coming for them. He's coming for everyone who needs a safety net because these people hate safety nets. And the reason why they can sustain the hatred of a safety net is because they have got their own. 90 minutes after 11 is the time. The number you need is 03456060973. I've no idea what the question is, but I know that we need to talk about this. James O'Brien on LBC. So what do you think of it? What do you think of Rishi Sunak's assault upon the safety net? His conviction that plenty of people currently unable to work according to their medical uh, condition, signed off by an actual doctor, are... Just, just one push, one nudge, one shove away from being able to return fully formed into the workplace. Um, I've got a lot of calls waiting, which is a bit odd because I haven't asked a question yet. Uh, but I, I, I do want to give a little bit of priority, if I can, to doctors, I, I, to actual GPs, um, and your response to the implication that you're signing people off without really any justification. You're signing people off sick for, for, for um, inadequate reasons. You're signing people off sick who'd be perfectly capable of going to work if only they could sit down with Rishi Sunak for 10 minutes. Joe's in Bromley. Joe, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, Joe. Um, so basically, I was off ill. I work in communications, just to give you a bit of a background story. Yeah. I work in communications, installing internet in people's houses, up ladders, in manholes, all that kind of stuff. Health yeah. and safety is really imperative. I'm going through a divorce, which doesn't help. But obviously, you know, sleepless nights is a common occurrence. Yes. Going through what I'm going through. And I just wasn't, I wasn't safe enough to be at work. So management took the decision to give me some time off. Um, did you go and talk to them? To? Management. Or, di or di did you go and talk to the doctor? How did you reach that point where they made that decision? If you don't mind me Well, asking. management, yeah, no, management saw me. I'm quite a bubbly person. I, I bring a lot of energy to the workplace. And oh. I don't, I try not to bring home to work sort of thing yes. but they, they they saw the drop in mood they saw my, my productivity fail I, mm. I just wasn't you know every time they saw me they said to me you look tired you know that kind of stuff so yeah. I was kind of being you know a man not you know kind of I do know taking note of the problem but someone that noticed someone said are you all right Joe Literally, that's what happened, yeah. Wow. And, um, Can I ask who you so work anyways, for? Because I think we should give them a bit of credit, shouldn't we? You don't have to tell me. Yeah, I've, yeah I work for Open Reach. I don't know okay. if I'm allowed to say it. Well, you have now, so that's really, fine. But that's, yeah. no, I think they deserve, I mean, it might just have been an individual, but it's more likely to be a part of a comp, co company culture. But someone actually spotted it that you were off, you were off your game and is. they came to check on you. What happened next? Tell me what happened next. So, obviously, I went through the whole process of, you know, speaking to people and getting the help that I needed. You mean doctors? Um, doctors, of yeah. course, yeah. No, and, you know, just being able to talk in general. And I think as men, we don't really talk when we need to talk. It, yeah. it gets to a point where everything boils over and then you're, you're not talking, you're shouting because you're emotional, you're stressed, whatever the case is. Um, I, I called up more so to say that before this government decides to get rid of this safety net, yeah. most companies... If any company, like all the companies that I've ever worked for, they have a limit to the safety net. You can't abuse it. You can't take advantage of it. If you know, they're gonna. I wasn't pressured to get back into work, but I was asked, "Are you ready to get back into yeah, work?" Of Whatever the case is. And also, I was I was off of work for a month and a half. I didn't have the financial worries with with that yeah. because the company is really well in that in that in them regards. But I was bored. I was. You know, it wasn't. I wasn't being productive. I felt as though it was kind of counter 
um, counterproductive being you off just of needed work. to recharge your batteries by the sound of it exactly exactly um, but and for some people that that, that that would take a hell of a lot longer than a month and a half but happily for I, you I, it didn't I, I personally believe that I probably came back to work a little too soon right. um, but you know, it, it, it worked out in my favour because I'm busy with work. I'm keeping on top of things. I've got Good. a bit of a routine going on. I'm nice sleeping a lot better. I've got a lot more to look forward to sort of things. Um, the only issue with that is, like I said, um, companies have a limit with this. It's not, you know, uh, the Tory is always trying to make these things seem as though it's completely, nobody really checks or whatever the case is. No, mm. I was sent off of work sick by management. Um, because I wasn't, you know, safe at work. Um, that is also on the other, on the flip side to that is that I will have a formal meeting to discuss whether or not I should get a warning for taking the time off that I've needed to. So, well, ho you know, ho like, hopefully that that the conclusion of that meeting will be that you you didn't take it off unnecessarily yeah. that you yeah, took yeah, it off. Of well, course. I mean, this isn't I, because you're being dealt with it, it, in the private sector, as it were, in the in in the context sure. of, of your employer. You're not you're not banging the sights of Rishi Sunak. But my goodness me, Joe, you're an illustration of the importance of getting the help that you need and getting signed off sick when you are sick. And, and I'm grateful to you for telling that story and making the point about men as well and how we bottle our problems up quite often and, and, and don't, um, don't articulate sadness and, and, and that makes absolutely everything worse. It's like the mental equivalent of a waiting list. You think of mental health as, as, as being pressure internal pressure and the tradition in this country particularly among men is to tighten the lid and and, and, and tighten the pressure cooker tighten the pressure cooker and, and then of course rather than finding help in in releasing it gently and slowly it will blow off at some point and that's that's worse for absolutely everybody concerned the waiting list for a physical ailment for a physical condition is similar because for most people the condition will get worse the longer the wait for treatment not not for everybody maybe not even for most but for a lot of people so your ability to go back to work is being diminished with every passing month and they've been in power for 14 years zach's in edinburgh zach what would you like to say uh, hi james Hello. um uh, nice to be speaking with you again Likewise. um you're a doctor so i think you're, you're, you're an nhs doctor yeah, so I, I work as a medical registrar in, in a hospital uh, in the Scottish borders. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's quite a stressful job. But the point I wanted to make was that people who get signed off uh, work with stress, often that is their last negotiating tactic when their employers are not listening to them or not wanting to negotiate with them. Whereas in the past, people would have been able to join a union or they would have been able to negotiate um, to work uh, part-time. Uh, those um, protections for workers have been eroded over many decades. And now what we're seeing is that people, when they have those problems at work, getting signed off with stress is really the only way that they can give themselves a bit of breathing space. And that's something that I don't think we're recognising in this debate. Well, I mean, only because you hadn't got on yet, Zach. We're recognising it now. So, so uh, some of the other safety nets have been removed by legislation. I think I can confidently say by by unions, by uh, by Tories, right wing media launching sustained attacks on unions continue to do so. So, the support that you might expect to find in the workplace when you are temporarily unable to fulfil your duties full time has gone leaving you with little choice and and something about the balance of power in employers. Joe's not being in this category. Joe's employer being quite a good example of um, how employers can operate. But they we've all worked for people who, who pride themselves on being unpleasant. And th they won't say, oh, well, why don't you just go part time for a couple of weeks? Or perhaps we could have a talk about your hours or perhaps we could help you deal with or we could take you out of that situation that you're finding difficult and redeploy you you'll come up against various brick walls in terms of personnel management and then lo and behold things get so bad you go to the doctor and the doctor says i'm going to have to sign you off sick because you can't yeah. go back to work in this state 
Um, absolutely, and um, you know, so it, it's really a political act. This, you know, tra- trying to get signed up, signed off, and and what makes me really angry about what Rishi Sunak's doing is that he's taking that decision out of the hands of a GP who knows the patient is incentivised to help the patient, yeah. and he's going to give it to healthcare professionals who work in the Department for Work and Pensions and who are not going to be incentivised to put the worker at the heart of the right. decisions that they're making. Just, this just is about taking away that negotiating tactic from employees so that they have to put up with whatever whatever their employer's offering. Just um, pause you know, there. The w- just, just pause there. Yeah. Forget about the bit about negotiating tactics. Just repeat, and I want everybody to listen to this very, very carefully. Just repeat the bit that you just said about what happens when you take away this decision-making process from doctors and give it instead to civil servants whose job really is to reduce expenditure. Yeah, so your GP is an independent uh, contractor with the government. They're only incentivised to help you, the patient, and their population. It would be entirely different if you're taking that decision out of the hands of your GP and putting it into the hands of a healthcare professional that's employed by the Department of Work and Pensions. That's what this is really about. And, you know, it it makes me very angry, actually, thinking about what's going to be happening to people. Well, it makes me bloody livid. Now, you've explained it like that and I was pretty cross already thank you doctor it's half past 11 you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC I leave you with the thoughts of John Crace the parliamentary sketch writer for the Guardian and uh, um, all round splendid contributor to public discourse Um, now I see it he writes this morning and I'm really sorry by having a heart attack I have let my country down more importantly I have let Rishi Sunak down Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines James O'Brien on LBC It is 26 minutes to 12. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Well, you are, but Alex isn't. Alex has been in touch, I think, quite considerately. Nice to keep me in the loop, Alex, to say I'd love to be listening to you today, James, but I'm sorry I've got 31 new songs from Taylor Swift to get through. Um, As a fellow Swifty, Alex, I'm fully sympathetic to your situation, and I tell you who I wouldn't want to be today, and that is Joe Alwyn. Bit niche, that, but um, probably not as niche as you think, actually, given the popularity of Taylor Swift. 11.34 is the time. Rishi Sunak, he wants to be completely clear about what I'm saying here. This is not about making the welfare system less generous to people who face very real extra costs from mental health conditions. For those with the greatest needs, we actually want to make it easier to access with fewer requirements. That's good. Um, So doctors will be deciding who has the greatest needs, will they? Oh, no, 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 no. No, that, that will be people at the, at the DWP, or that will be assessors. What's the point of that? Well, we need to save money. Yeah, but what, what if there is no money to be saved? What if, and I say this uh, carefully, what, what if the massive, massive, massive majority of people signed off sick are actually, wait for it, are actually sick? Okay, there's the bloke over there in a string vest, smoking woodbine, who hasn't worked since 1973. To be fair, he should have retired by now. But I take your point. We all think we know a lead swinger. Or we all know someone who knows 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 someone who is taking the mickey. Just like all those immigrants who were coming over here to nick our jobs and sign on and send all the money home and take our houses all at the same time. Didn't actually know one yourself, but you knew they existed because you kept reading about them in the Daily Mail or on Twitter, what if the massive majority of people off sick are sick? Then what's the point of this policy? 11.36 is the time. Nikki's in Guildford. Nikki, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, I am absolutely furious, James. Um, very ha- no, nice to speak to you. I'm a bit scared. So, so, a bit so, scared it's only me? It's only me? <laughs> what are you scared I've run in before, not to you, to other people, but anyway... Go on. This is really important, I think, for me to... I just, I'm just exploding at the scene. Go on. I worked for a uh, programme called The Work... There's always been a work and health programme. Yes. In some form or another but from the government. So the work and health programme, it was a two-year contract. So basically, um, it was... Um, it was voluntary, but, but from the... So you, we would have people referred to us from various um, job centres. Yes. And in fact, it was basically recruitment 
with no commission, if if if, you, if I can put it like that. Yeah. Um, and every so you have a caseload of people. We are not. We were not. Tra- we're not trained properly. They don't tell you the types of people or anything about the job until you come on. It's an absolute joke. We was a ca- we. It was an American company subcontracted from another by, by the DWP, so a private sector, a big private sector company that is huge. So the whole thing is just, a, in my mind, a big money making thing. So you and get they, they you, you you're on the pa- you're on the payroll, but you're not really clear about what it is you're supposed to be doing. And all the people that have employed you care about is that the stream of people ensures that the stream of money continues. Correct. Right. It's, it's, it's a disgrace. And then they treat the staff, well, I can't even go into it, this American company quite well. Well, t- were, tell me about well. the clients before you tell me about the, the, the terms and oh, conditions I of mean, employment. What sort of people were, were, were coming well, through your doors? The expectation was that you had to get four people a job a month. Right. Right. Now, the sort of people coming through were maybe middle-aged, I mean, really people that were really genuinely, and I swear on my life, go on. not ready to go to work yeah the whole point of the program was to help them through a journey to get them to work and with some people it was just it's never going to happen yeah it's just terribly terribly sad and you have to be a really resilient person i don't know anyone i worked with i don't know how i managed to do it for three years because the way that we're treated by the upper management was terrible and people genuinely cared i worked with people who really really did care about what they were doing but they were banging their head against a brick wall most of the time because the, 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 the people that they were supposed to be getting into jobs were, were, were signed off sick for a reason and were not ready. Yep. Well, what about, yep. I mean, if I was to be the devil's advocate, I, I, I would say, wasn't it your job to make them ready? Yeah, that was the job. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were lots of, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the word, um, uh, Oh, I can't, help me out here, James. I can't. I, well, I don't. Uh, I don't know what's going on in your head. Lots of places to go okay. for various things would help. Yes. Um, and we, you know, there are they are out there. But this is in Surrey, yeah. where everybody thinks that Surrey is, you know, ravingly posh, uh, posh rich. and rich. Yes. And there's a huge population of people that are in poverty in this county. Um, so, oh, provisions. That's what I was looking provisions for. Provisions for healthcare. Lots of provisions we signpost people to places. Right. X Y Z. And um, I was one of these people who was outspoken, and they tried to get rid of me as well. There's another thing. Uh, I had more disciplinary. So they're ju- they're, yeah, so they're just taking lot. the system that you're describing and, and are trying to give it even more to do, make it an even bigger part of the process, trying to get it to mop up even more of what is currently being done by GPs. And the only doctor we've spoken to was, if anything, Nikki, even angrier than you about these proposals. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of asking who likes it. But I kind of know that you won't know what you're talking about if you do like it. I, I, I know what the Daily Mail will say about this. I know what the uh, uh, usual suspects will say about this. Uh, it will all be prefaced by, oh, no, I don't mean you. There are definitely some people who are in real need. But there's loads that aren't. And we should stone them. I, I, but how do you know? Who knows? The only people that could tell you probably are the doctors who could begin to explain to you how big a problem it is people who could be working but are choosing instead to be signed off sick 0345 6060973 is the number you need you've heard the story you've heard the prime minister you've seen the targeting of people signed off sick that is that is the constituency of people that rishi sunak is blaming today for uh, economic uh, slowness and targeting today for uh, treatment for harsh treatment or or or, um, or, or life changing treatment. What is it? Claire's in crew. Claire, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, um, we actually get two lots of pip in this house. Um, I get it myself because I've got severe Crohn's disease. Right. Um, and there is no job that I could do that involves just living in the bathroom. Mm. Um, my son is seventeen. He's autistic. Right. And we, he would love a job. He's begging us for a job. Aww. But there just isn't one out there. So I, I kind of, I'm 50% agree that, oh, I'd hate to say this, that I'm agreeing with him. Yeah. I'm not even going to say his name. Um, I, I agree that there needs to be some kind of help for people like my son. Yes. But he can't just write everybody off and he can't say that, 
people with mental health and anxiety should just sort themselves out and get a job. But where would the help come from? It it has to be employer-driven, I would have thought. It has to be a a, a quest, a mission to make employers understand that somebody like your son could be a great asset to their company, but that the way things are set up at the moment, it's never going to happen. No, because employers would actually be paid for taking my son on. They get like the... the, the, the But that already exists, does it? Yeah, it already exists. But there's no um, job that suits him that you no, can find. There's, there's just nobody will take him on with that oh. kind of problem. Um, well, so there's well, people like myself that yeah. can't work. and will, I, I, I'm a nurse, um, and I haven't worked for 20 years. I'd love to work, but there's nothing I could do. And you've got to accept that there are people out there that... It's very difficult to get pipped. Well, it, yeah, it is very difficult to get pipped. I'm glad you said that, because that's missing from Rishi Sunak's analysis as well, I think. This uh, creating yeah. the sense. And I know, you know, being, being signed off sick is not the same as pip, but it sounds to me that he's trying to make it more like pip, actually. Just get there's just the simple sick note. He's trying to make that a much bigger, a much smaller hoop to get through. Yeah, but that's what but he's there will be there, there will be lots of people who are not as ill as you. I mean, I, I, I don't want to go into uh, gr- grisly detail, but but you said you're in the bathroom all the time. You, you're, you're on and off the toilet all day, aren't you? Yeah. There'll yeah. Be, but there'll be people signed off sick who, who are not as sick as you, won't they? Or are not as poor, whose condition is not as debilitating as yours. I don't even see what he's done to make their lives better or to, or to accept frighten them into thinking that they're going to have the pittance they currently live on taken away. Well, and it is a pittance. That's what he's not mentioning. And we're not like all living in, like you know, I'm getting like three thousand pound a week or whatever. Well, it's can not I ask a what you are? Can I ask what are you getting? Well, you don't have to tell me. It's, but I'm interested. Um, I think it's about four hundred pound a month. Right. Um, so it's about a hundred pound a week, which is nothing when you think what I could be earning as a nurse. Yeah. So we're not all just sitting around like... No, but I don't know that anybody is, you see, really. I, I, you know, the, the, I wish we could find a magic wand or something and actually identify how many people fit the stereotype, fit the tabloid stereotype of scrounging. You know, that's the word, isn't it? There's, there's, that's the subtext here. When, it, when sick, note, sick note becomes a pejorative, you're supposed to question everybody because you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And if you can't, you're a scrounger. But they add on rent benefit, housing benefit, council tax benefit onto like when they say like, you know, James is earning 30,000 a year. Yeah, yeah. That's everything that they're getting. Well, I, I mean, it works. In a little bit. No, it's not in your bank account every week, but it works, of course, with people who have to pay all of the things that you've just described and who think that there's a sort of fundamental unfairness attached to anybody who doesn't have to pay it. If you stop and ask, what would you rather? Would you rather have to spend your day on the lavatory like Claire does? Or would you rather um, have the deal that you've currently got with regard to taxation and expenditure? Uh, They'd all choose, just as Claire would choose, not to be Claire. But that's not how tabloid journalism works. And sadly, and I will mention the new book at the moment, because it comes out, the paperback comes out on Thursday. Sadly, we've created a country where the government now does what, when I started this job 20 years ago, was still happily confined to unpleasant right-wing tabloid journalism. The government does it now. The, the people like Braverman and, um, uh, well, all of them really, Johnson, uh, uh, Gove, they, they all take uh, uh, unsustainable, unevidenced prejudice and turn it into policy. That's how you end up with the small boats. That's how you end up with the demonization of sick notes. Uh, you, you, that's how you end up with Brexit. You, you might as well have just asked 10 years ago what's going on in the fever dreams of Rupert Murdoch and the editor of the Daily Mail and just stick it straight on the statute book because that is that is where we've been led. That's where we've been taken. And it ain't over yet. It's 11.46. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.49 is the time. Do you know, whenever I say safety net, whenever I start talking to you about safety nets in the context of catching people who need help and we're talking about it at the moment because of Rishi Sunak's speech this morning in which he essentially targeted the biggest safety net of all the the the, the welfare state but particularly the uh, support that's in place for people who are off sick I, whenever i say the word safety net in that context i immediately think of make some noise which is of course um, my employer globals uh, great charity that addresses 
um, areas that sometimes get overlooked um, in the context of both care and charity, small charities doing quite specific jobs. Because I, I, I sometimes have to do the, 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 the job of giving the speech at the, at, the, at the sort of annual gala. And I always describe it as having to knit your own safety nets, knit little safety nets, because the big one does its job. We're all up on the trapeze, but there are holes in it. And, and to not overwork the analogy, but sometimes you've got to get a safety net below the safety net for the people who slip through the cracks. And it's sadly becoming more urgent and more important with every passing year. I mention this because today is a very special day in the LBC calendar. It is the celebration day, if you like, for LBC's official charity, Global's Make Some Noise, and all the small charities we are supporting. With your help, your help, this year's Global's Make Some Noise is changing over 21,000 lives across the country. You may remember that last October you helped us raise money for Make Some Noise, and today we are um, exploring and celebrating the difference that your donations have made, helping to fund vital, life-changing, but crucially, as I say, small projects right across the UK, um, doing our best to make sure that no one is left facing life's toughest challenges alone. Hannah Asquith is the CEO of Youth Concern, which is one of the small charities supported by Make Some Noise, and she joins me now. Hannah, hello. Hi. Let us begin with a, with a few words about what it is that Youth Concern does, and perhaps what would happen if Youth Concern wasn't there. Youth Concern is a little charity in Aylesbury Vale in Buckinghamshire, and we've been supporting 13 to 25 year olds since 1979. We call ourselves an open access service. We're here for any 13 to 25 year old in Aylesbury Vale, but we specialise in helping the young people who face additional challenges. So through our drop-in centre, which is our shop front, uh, we have two homelessness prevention projects and a counselling service. It's all available free of charge. What would happen if we weren't here? Yeah. Um, we had 1,100 young people come through our doors last year through our drop-in centre, more accessing counselling and more through our homelessness prevention work. I just don't know where they would be turning, particularly now when the, the local authorities are strapped for cash. They're changing the way that they make donations or contract the charities. They're not able to provide the services that, that, that we do. So there'd be 1,100 kids in Aylesbury Vale who'd fallen through the cracks last year. Last year alone. And that's just <coughs> last year, yeah. Um, no such thing as a typical client, I don't no. imagine. But but could no. you describe a couple of memorable ones to us in the context of the help that you were able to provide? We had a, um, a young man come to us. He came to our drop-in centre. Um, he was 19 when he came to our door. He'd been sofa surfing which quite often is how young people present when they're homeless they're not actually sleeping rough they're the hidden homeless he'd been sofa surfing and he came to our drop-in center and asked if he could use our toilet to have a wash so we told him we have a, a shower and we've got a washing machine and a tumble dryer so we spent a few days looking after him like that he accessed our youth food bank and he had hot meals with us and he moved into our supported accommodation project. So this is a house where we can house up to nine previously homeless young people for up to 18 months. And it's an amazing project that can turn young people's lives around if they want to engage. So he'd been homeless, he had mental health issues, and he was coping by drinking quite a lot of alcohol. He, he told us he'd fallen into the wrong crowd. Mm. He couldn't see a way out. By the time he moved out, only eight months later, he had benefited from our counselling service, he'd got a full-time job, he'd got a flat, and he'd stopped drinking. And he wrote to us, and this doesn't happen often, but he wrote to us to say, and I quote him now, this all started with staying at Youth Concern. I wanted to send you a note to thank you for the help last year. It turned my life around. That's pretty special, isn't it? Now, you, you know what has happened to your Make Some Noise grant, don't you? You know how much you'll get, because I used to surprise people in the studio. I was prepared to sound surprised. No, no, because I can't surprise people anymore, because <laughs> I start crying. 
So I say, you applied for a grant of just under £30,000. And then I do a terrible pause, like something off the flipping X Factor or something. I go, but you're not getting £30,000. <laughs> I even did it one year with a big cheque. They made me do it with a big cheque, like some sort of footballer from the 1970s <laughs> getting signed for Nottingham Forest. But if I, Because if I saw your face when you found out you were getting £60,000... I'd have to go to a break and, and compose myself. Well, I don't think I'd be able to speak either. <laughs> when I got the phone call, I did cry. <laughs> I bet you cried. What, what's it going to do? Where, where is that £60,000 donated by LBC listeners and other, other global yeah, radio listeners so going to go? What does it mean? We applied for just under £30,000 and that was going to fund counselling for up to 20 young people for a year. And then we heard last month that Globals Make Some Noise will more than double the amount that you're going to give us and you're going to fund two years worth of counselling for up to 40 young people. So what that means is that 40 young people's mental health will be improved as they meet their counsellor one-to-one, face-to-face, by phone or virtually. And the impact the grant will have on young people is huge. So in the last six months alone, we've delivered 705 individual counselling sessions. That's 118 sessions a month. We've assessed 22 new young people for counselling. And then coincidentally, it's the same number. We've taken on another 22 young people. So in my four years at Youth Concern, we've grown the number of young people we can counsel from 28 to 60 at one time. The, the money that you will be donating to us and the listeners have given to this campaign just means those young people have got the safety net you were talking about. How, how do people find out about you? How do people in, in, in the area... Because I, I love the idea of a lad just sort of popping in because he couldn't think of anywhere else to go to have a wee or whatever. A lot of young wash. people come from word of mouth. Right. So their friends might say to them, you should come to Youth Concern, there's a pool table, there's a ping-pong table, there's a music recording studio, right. there's free food... Mm. They come and it might be the third or fourth visit that they realise we can go deeper and they might confide about something serious that's happening in their life and we can we can support them. That's where our work really starts. One of the things I love about Youth Concern is the young people are very keen <laughs> to tell us warts and all what we're doing right or what we're not doing right. <laughs> and um, we ask the young people that we counsel um, on a 10-week basis, really, how they feel about our service. Yeah. And 4.9 out of 5 rate us really highly. And they say things like, my counsellor accepts me, my counsellor understands me, I'm satisfied with the service, I would recommend my counsellor. So they only need to go and say that to their mates at college mm. or at school or in their supported accommodation project or at work. And we have more young people come through the door. Well, thank you for everything you do. And thank you for coming in today to tell us a little bit about it. I, I, I've got some less happy statistics. Well, it's, they start off happy. We're, we're, the charities that we've supported over the last 10 years, 92% um, of them have reported an increase in people coming to them for support in the last year alone. I'm sure that Youth Concern has as well. Um, and, and some of the charities that we've helped over the years have seen more than a 50% increase in demand in the last year. You know why. Cost of living crisis, high inflation, a lot of the issues that we've been discussing in, in the last hour of the programme contributing to a phenomenon that sees many charities recording an increase in demand for their services from people struggling. 52% of the charities we spoke to have had to turn people away or, or, or refer them on or add them to a waiting list because they can't keep up with the number of people who need their help, all of which, I think, leads me inevitably to a reminder of how you can help. In supporting Make Some Noise, your donations are reaching small charities like Hannah's, like Youth Concern, and not only giving them a chance to survive, but, as Hannah has just explained, giving them a chance to reach even more people in need. We've got no idea how many... Because I, I, the thing you've said that has really struck me was it being the third or fourth visit before they come and say, actually, I'm not just here for a game of pool. I'm the kind of person that you could help. So how many people are wandering around? That's what worries me too. Yeah. Um, when it comes to counselling, the other place that re the referrals come through is CAMS, yes. which is statutory provision. But in Buckinghamshire, CAMS is now so stretched. If somebody is 13 to 25, well, it would be 13 to 18, it's of children. Um, they just directly refer to youth concern. When I see, wow. when you talk about the numbers, 
We expected to welcome 800 young people to our drop-in centre last year. We actually welcomed 1,150. That's an increase of 47% on the previous year's numbers. And when I look at the last six months alone, we've already welcomed 730 young people. So So we're on track for our busiest year ever. You can donate £10, £20, £30 or £40 by texting LBC10, LBC20, LBC30 or LBC40. No spaces, just just LBC10, LBC20, LBC30. You know where I'm going with this. Or LBC40 and you send it to 70766. That's 707. 70- Six six, one hundred percent of any donation you can make will go to Global's Make Some Noise. You do need to be sixteen or over, and um, do seek the bill payers' permission. Standard network charges apply, and the full terms and conditions are at makesomenoise dot com. That's LBC ten, LBC twenty, LBC thirty, or LBC forty, and you just text it to seven zero seven six six. Give you a little idea of what £40 could pay for. That would that would cover a session, a one-on-one counselling session for the kind of young person that Hannah has described, someone experiencing mental health difficulties, someone quite possibly referred by uh, CAMS, which, which cannot cope with demand for its services. £30 could help clothe three young people currently experiencing homelessness. And remember, that will include sofa surfing. It just means you haven't got a place that you can call home. If you can give £20, you will be buying... For for example, personal hygiene and sanitary products for a vulnerable young person who, who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford them. But anything you can give, big or small, will make a difference. To donate more than £40, uh, just go to the website. Go to makesomenoise.com and follow the incredibly straightforward instructions. Um, it's a chance for us all to come together to help change more lives. Um, Hannah Esquith, thank you for joining thank me today. Thank you so much. Could I just finish by thanking my amazing staff and volunteer team? No. Okay. <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> I think one of the things that's really hard is people come into this kind of work because they want to make a difference. We're not paid no. massive salaries. And so when the, ser- the demand for our service is huge, we have staff who are going the extra mile again and again. And I just thank goodness that they are all here doing the critical work they are so um, team it's a pleasure and a privilege to work with you and youth concern is only able to help a thousand plus young people every year because we're a fantastic team thank you for that and and thank you to to to, to all of your colleagues for doing all of the things that they do um it is now two minutes after 12 i i wouldn't have been late for the news if it wasn't for hannah but there you go i'm joking of course i would i'm always late for the news (laughs) james o'brien on lbc it is six minutes after 12 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, it was an odd hour, I've not the bit with Hannah, but the first 45 minutes, we I just sort of vented really. This stuff boils my blood, it really does. And uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to bother putting you in idiot's corner, but, but a couple of people pointing out that I'm nowhere near the bread line. Well done, mate. What do you want? A biscuit? empathy involves two things it it, it involves in its purest and most beautiful form it involves deep concern for people suffering in ways that you will never suffer although your confidence that you will never suffer can sometimes be misplaced but if you need to make things a little bit less altruistic empathy can sometimes be just imagining that you are in the same situation as somebody else and wanting the world to change to make that situation better um, because you might be in it one day. My favourite philosopher, uh, one of my favourite philosophers, is an American called John Rawls. I've talked to you about him a few times. And to be fair, I, I probably misremember or, 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 or misrepresent what I learned at university a million years ago. But he came up with an idea called the veil of ignorance, right? And I'm going to take a moment now. Yvette and Ash are up next. But I want to tell you what the veil of ignorance was. I think Rawls used it essentially to posit a legal system, not not, not a broader political framework than that. But what it does is posit the possibility that you know nothing about where you sit in society or where you are. So, for example... What would you say about the death penalty if there was a chance that you'd killed someone once in anger? 
you, if you if I could actually wipe your memory clean, if I could rob you of any knowledge of who or what you were, your opinions would probably be different from what they are now. So, for example, you don't know how much money you've got. You could have nothing. You could be one of the young people that Hannah and her colleagues at Youth Concern look after who's sleeping on a mate's sofa, or you could be Prince William. So what opinion would you hold about the distribution of wealth? Because if you're sleeping on a sofa, that's going to inform your opinion. And if you're inheriting golden chairs, that's going to, inherit, that's going to inform your opinion. So the veil of ignorance posits the idea that we should build our justice system according to not knowing where we would sit in it. And it occurred to me during the news that if you want to look at people who are signed off sick, I can't think of a better example of the power of the veil of ignorance. So you sit here now thinking, or Rishi Sunak, oh, they're all taking the mickey. They're all spending money. They're all doing this. They're all doing that. Uh, but what if it was you? What if you were signed off sick? What would you want the system to be like if you were signed off sick? And there it is. I'm fairly confident you wouldn't want it to be anything like what it is now or anything like what it will be like if Sunak's around for long enough to implement the measures that he announced today. I've got to go to the D. I can't. So the doctor doesn't decide whether I'm too sick to work you, that some person in the dwp does an assessor an unspecified assessor does and their job their literal job because this is why the policy is being introduced is to reduce the amount of money being spent on sickness benefit so the success of their employment will be judged by how much money they can take away from people who are currently receiving sickness benefits the gp's job is to look after sick people of course, I think it was Zach, a doctor in Scotland, who reminded us that the, the, the GP is the point of last resort. Once your union rep could have gone into bat for you or your personnel department would have been a little bit more concerned with the health and welfare of staff. There may even have been some laws in play. You know that. But we've got a government now that thinks health and safety is an unnecessary imposition, that thinks regulation in the workplace equals red tape and should be ripped up and burned. We've got politicians um, in positions of prominence who think that giving help to people is a sign of weakness and that they should just be whipped back to work. And what would they be like if they were signed off sick? So imagine if everybody was cloaked in the veil of ignorance and, and framed the system in the knowledge that they could need it themselves. So that's why I started with... I didn't realise I was going to be popping up on the veil of ignorance again, but that's why I started by pointing out that Rishi Sunak will never need this system. He will never, ever, ever need it. And that doesn't mean he's not capable of understanding its importance or respecting its role, but it makes it a little bit harder. And I'm afraid he has not risen to that challenge. So what, what would you want sickness benefit to be like if you knew there was a strong chance you were going to need it one day. Just try to think of it like that. And I, and I might have just provided you with an antidote to the usual right-wing stereotyping of, of, of people who are vulnerable or in need. Um, I'll go back to the phones. The question I, I haven't asked is essentially, what do you make of it? What's your response to today's announcement? We took the speech live on LBC. If you were listening to The Breakfast Show, you'd have heard it. Otherwise, you'd have picked up on nuggets in the news bulletin or, or you'd have got a fairly clear idea about... Um, what was in it from, from my uh, descriptions. Simon Case, a lot of you are reminding me, was signed off sick for a while. I, I, I wonder whether or not he's one of the people that Rishi Sunak, the cabinet secretary, of course, who couldn't, I don't think, make it to the COVID inquiry, could he? Because he was signed off sick at the time. He's back now. Uh, I wonder if he's one of the people that Rishi Sunak has got, has got in mind. But the, the, that, that question, you know what, what's gone on. You've heard it. Where are you going? What, 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 what do you think? What do you make of it all? What's your reaction, your first reaction today? 0345 606 And then I think we'll move on, perhaps, to the question of why there is so much sickness, why it is on the rise. Yvette's in Farnborough. Yvette, what would you like to say? Well, forgive me, because I'm nervous. Uh, not only nervous about being on the radio, but my blood is boiling as well. Go on. Um, 
I, I had a snatch of, of a Sunak this morning and the, the questions he asked was, why, has, why are so many people off sick now? In mm. the last 10 years, it mm. has risen. I would, ask, I would want someone to ask him, well, does he not think that the, the cutbacks and the, the way our NHS is broken now yeah. Yeah. reflects that? And the second thing I wanted to say was, and that, that is what really makes my blood boil, the way the assessment process is carried out now for people who claim employment and support allowance is that they provide a fit note or a sick note, fit note it's called, yeah. and then they submit their claim through universal credit and then they have a face-to-face assessment or a telephone assessment with a health professional. And that person then decides whether or not they warrant, uh, they might get new yeah. style ESA, yeah. which is, is um, if they've got enough contribution, if they haven't, they don't get anything extra anyway. What, what I would ask was why the, own, the people who know a claimant, a patient best, is the GP. To create another tier of assessment, which is what it is, seems a ridiculous waste of money. I would ask who, who is benefiting financially from that extra tier that's being created? Um, Are you asking that rhetorically? or, or I am or, asking that rhetorically. I would like someone in the media to ask that. Well, I, I, we got a hint already. earlier. We got a hint earlier that, that you know, I, I can't name any company specifically, but it's highly well, likely that there'll be these big sort of oh, they are. service they are. provision they, utility they companies that have shareholders and make donations to the Tory party. Yes, well, I would agree with that. And, and I think that needs to be exposed. Mm. Just to, to, to just to sort of clarify a bit. Yes. I, I work for a charity. I volunteer for a charity two days a week for the past 16 years. I'm a benefits advisor. Right. I help claimants challenge DWP decisions about employment. So Port Allowance and PIP, I know we're talking about yes. sickness benefit at the moment. My rate of success in, in my branch of my charity is very good mm. but nationally 60 percent it might be more than that now 60 percent of dwp decisions are overturned when the the claimant goes to appeal through the courts and that's quite a, a staggering statistic really isn't it what a waste of money that is <laughs> if, the, if the processes right. were put a, in properly and the government is saying let's have more of that Let's extend the remit of this system that is so unfit for purpose to accommodate everybody who's off sick. And I'll tell you what else we need to do, Yvette. We need to get rid of the people who are trained to recognise and diagnose illness when we're trying to support sick people who cannot work due to illness. That's the other bit of today's Mm -hmm. announcement. The inference is that he doesn't trust GPs, isn't it? I don't. That, well, that's, we could in, we could infer that. Yes, it is. He yes, he easy. thinks he thinks that they're signing people off for an easy life. Absolutely, and they're not. We no. all know they're not. And and I said to your researcher that producer, in, producer, <laughs> producer. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I spoke to your producer, <laughs> and um, in the sixteen years that I have been with my charity, yes. and through the work that I do, I have probably met. And I'm a good judge of character now. I have probably met two people that I think mm. wow I, I, I wow and we're framing the whole policy for them oh we uh, are can you put and a figure on how many people though, can, I don't want to be political but it's a dog whistle to oh benefit scroungers yes, going back to is. Osborne and the curtain twitches of course and all it that, is it's absolutely it is why don't you want to be political you're brilliant at it but, but practically uh, being very practical it is going to co- in- introducing another tier of assessment for someone a health professional in inverted commas to decide whether someone is fit enough to work and give them a fit note is going to cost money why not put that cost money into mental health services into gp services that's all I've got to say, James. You're doing such a brilliant job in everything that you do. Well, not compared to you. You're actually making real change to real people's lives. Can we put a vague figure? If, if there's two people where you've got the vaguest hint of rat, the vaguest whiff of rat when it comes to the situation in which they have found themselves, can we get a, a very rough figure of how many people might have crossed your threshold over those 16 years? Or would that be too hard to calculate? Oh, that would be too hard to calculate. But, but hundreds... Hundreds. There it is. 
So I, sm- I, smaller, um, than a, smaller than a, a percent of a percent of a percent of a percent of possible, possibly problematic people seem to be the launch pad for this entire policy. Would choose to live on 74 quid a week. Well, there it is. And, and you know, we can augment that 74 quid a week with, with the conversations about various reliefs and, and, and taxes. But ultimately, who would choose? And if some people do, they probably need help in a different way. To, to, to broaden their horizons or to enhance their aspirations. And if they don't, if there is a, a number of people who actually want help from the doctor in being able to live a life of, of comparative poverty, then that's the price you pay for having some safety net there for the people who need it. Yvette, what a beautiful call. Thank you so much. Um, ben Kentish has smashed it out of the park with a tweet here. Ben with you later tonight, I think. No, uh, Ben with you soon on LBC. Um, he's, he's tweeted, you could sort out the state of NHS mental health services or you could tell people needing them that they're the problem. 12.19. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 21 minutes after 12. Um, Gary has been in touch, my good mate Gary. He says, callers who state their nervousness at the outset are almost certain um, to be excellent. I'm fascinated by this phenomenon. So am I, actually, now you come to point it out. There, there is a correlation, I think, between, maybe there's a causation, between people who preface their contribution by, saying, by telling me how nervous they are and callers who go on to be brilliant. I think I might know why. I think it might be because, as Yvette just proved um, very powerfully, sometimes people are a little bit surprised to find themselves on air but the topic under discussion, or at least the treatment of the topic under discussion, is a matter of such profound personal importance to them that they feel compelled to contribute, even though part of them balks at the prospect of, of coming on the radio. And therefore, what happens if, if the nervousness can be um, put into abeyance, if the nervousness can be managed, then the brilliance of the call is defined by the passion of the caller for the subject under discussion. So, I, I mean, the opposite would be, and I'm not saying that everybody who fits into the category that I'm describing is awful, but the opposite would be the, uh, the people who get on all the time, the people that ring in on every subject under the sun. And there's a bit of pot kettle there, because I obviously have an opinion on every subject under the sun, but my role is a little different from yours as a caller or a listener. So uh, I, I suspect the people who aren't nervous at all, the ones that are, are, are ringing in every day all the time, turn out to often be quite mediocre contributors because they're not nervous enough, um, which is why it's very important to give out the phone number so that lots of new people can get on the programme and you don't end up talking to the same people every day. 23 minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, back to Rishi Sunak. What appears to be an assault upon the only safety net that many people have, policies that are built either on ignorance or cruelty, but quite possibly on both. But before all of that, I think I think we might... Should we open Idiot's Corner just quickly? This, this one is unsigned, but some a real person who is allowed to uh, use scissors sent this into the programme. What about the veil of ignorance for the poor taxpayers? You are a dangerous EU-supporting communist. Why not talk about what happened to Farage? Well, let's pick those off one by one, shall we? Because you've paid me the courtesy of getting in touch. You, you can't have the veil of ignorance for poor taxpayers, mate, because the veil of ignorance means you wouldn't know you were a poor taxpayer, you see? So the veil of ignorance would mean that you are as likely to be someone signed off sick as you are likely to be someone not signed off sick. So the system, the question then becomes, what would you like the system to do for you if you were signed off sick? I, I guess some people don't need a veil of ignorance because um, the ignorance is already pretty complete. You are a dangerous EU supporting communist. I can't, I can't argue that. You got me banged to rights. I, I, everything I say on the program uh, is an endorsement of the idea that the means of production should be owned by the by the workers. I, I, you, 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 got, you got me there. What has? I don't know what's happened to Farage. I've got a feeling you might be referring to events in Brussels earlier this week where. Uh, a meeting of various Fruit Loops and far-right weirdos was quite incorrectly cancelled or, or closed down by the mayor of the smallest commune in Brussels, by, by, by a Belgian mayor. But what happened was 
um, it went to court. It went to a foreign court where the freedom of assembly was upheld by judges who knew that if it wasn't, it would have gone to the Supreme Court of the European Union eventually, where the European Convention of Human Rights would have been invoked to ensure that the meeting you describe, I think you refer to, would have gone ahead. In this country, legislation is in place to stop people from, from gathering, whether or not it's for, for peaceful protest or other purposes. And of course, the politicians, including I think your friend Farage, don't like the European Convention of Human Rights. So uh, bizarrely, what you thought was a, was, was, was a sort of clever critique of the presenter of this programme, by sending it in, you've proved that you are... I think, the stupidest person listening to the show today. And that's, 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 I mean, to be fair, there aren't that many stupid people listening to the show anymore. But even if they were, I think you would still be the stupidest person listening to, 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 to the show today. And so I, I suspect that's probably the greatest achievement of your life. So congratulations. Ash is in Leicester. Ash, what would you like to say about sick note culture or, or, or whatever language we're supposed to be using today? Hi, James. Um, uh, I've been listening for well over a decade, and this is the first time I've been compelled to pick the bone off. There you go, proving my point. Now you're going to tell me how nervous you are. Well, I am very nervous. <laughs> yet, so let's, let's keep that one there. Okay. And so, so I work for a trade union, and so I'm looking at this from a point of view of somebody who signs off work um, sick, and from a process point of view, how that's actually going to happen. So oh, yeah. at the moment, you can self-certify for seven days, yeah. and then you need a fit note from a GP. So under Sunak's plans, he's going to, uh, people are self certified for seven days, and then they will need this appointment with the DWP or these health professionals, whoever they're going to get in. Yeah. And for me, what happens when that appointment, there's a delay on that import appointment, because there's no way that they're going to, co employers are going to be able to coordinate that within seven days. No way. You I mean, you could, you're lucky if you can get a GP's appointment within seven days because of what they've done to the NHS. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what happens in that space between being able to self for seven days and then um, not having this appointment where you can get your fit note? Are employers going to tell people to come back to work? Because I've worked with a lot of bad employers and I don't think there'll be many willing to run the risk or the gauntlet of forcing someone with potential depression back to work because of the, the, the consequences of that. And they've yeah. obviously got a duty to manage the health and safety and that risk management within the workplace. So I don't think that will happen. So I think we'll just end up in a position where we've added a layer of bureaucracy into the process. And ultimately, people are still going to have to visit the GP because it's a, it's a medical condition. Yeah. They're going to need that intervention and that monitoring from their GP. But then we're adding this la extra layer above of medical professionals. Where are we going to find these medical professionals from? I've just Googled this 50, 000, over 50,000 GPs. So that's a lot of capacity we're going to have to find if we, if if we, we're telling GPs they can't provide fit notes, it's just not going to work. Oh, do you know what I would have done a few years ago now? I, 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 I hope I wouldn't have been rude to you. I don't think I would have been. But I, I think there'd be a little bit of me that thought, that they couldn't possibly have missed this point so spectacularly and Ash in Leicester has just pulled their pants down on, on, on live radio. But actually, they're probably making this announcement knowing that they're never going to be, they're not going to be in power long enough to implement it. It's almost certainly come from one of the vampiric Tufton Street outfits dedicated to improving the financial situation of the anonymous super rich donors that fund their entire operation it will be embraced by the right-wing media that has cheered them whether they were putting liz truss in downing street turning us into the first country in history to impose economic sanctions on itself or pretending that boris johnson was um, a fit person to govern and therefore i think it's perfectly possible that that ash in leicester has spotted an almost fatal flaw in the entire bloody plan because who do you go to after seven days? The system's going to be up and running, is it? Or you go to the doctor and get your sick? Well, in that case, you're not sparing, you're not taking GPs out of the equation. No, no. And I think they've shown with the the mess they've created in early years, um, yeah. childcare provision, that, that there's, there's this delay where they will launch the, pro the process, but the systems won't be in place to kind of tolerate the demand. So then we're going to have a lot of people who either end up in this void where they're forced back to work 
by their employers or not, or just left in limbo. And the whole SSP claim will need to be changed because at the moment you don't need a fit note for that. It's just if it's three days, your employer can process it. So the, I, I don't think, in all honesty, they're on top of on top of the detail. That's all it is. And we, and we know that the Tories are the Tories. So we know they're not on top of the detail. Um, but from this, it's just a very basic process point of view. There's a lot of, there's a lot that, that can go wrong with that. And, and at the moment, like I, even the biggest organisations we deal with are occupational health departments. Yeah. Might be two or three occupational health practitioners. Wow. And that's for that's for or like large councils with over seven, eight thousand people. Help people back to work. The first thing you should do is start helping people back to work, not not flipping, per, but, but de- denying them of the support that they enjoy or that they have, the scant support they have while they're not at work. How big? Who can get a handle on how big the problem is of? The, the the people that Rishi Sunak identifies as and, and I use the words a bit carefully they really should be working but they're not um, or they really uh, could be working but they're not could stroke should you can have either I don't think the problem the problem is definitely not as bad as he's making out I, I, I've never come across anybody and I've been working for for a large trade union for over ten years now I've mm. never come across anybody who I'd look at who's sick and say, you're swinging the lead, ever. It just doesn't happen. You've got real desperate people out there who are not only under pressure at work because of austerity and cuts and probably doing the job of two or three people now. Yes. With the cost of living, people are under pressure. There's a burnout lag with COVID, so we're only really seeing now people I develop. That's a big kind of, deal. I think that's yeah, a big PTSD-like deal. Yeah, PTSD-like symptoms from yeah. COVID. Yeah. And I, and I just don't, we just don't see the, the, the people that you would label as you know, people swinging the leg. It just doesn't happen. We've got very desperate people out there who need support. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, you're talking a small minority, but they'll they'll pick those examples out and they'll, they'll point to them, won't they? Yeah, but, uh, but I mean... 99.9% of people... And, and that's it. And that's where the rhetoric seems to be coming from. And, and even their own numbers, you'd think they'd stop and think, hang on a minute, there's something going on here. And it's highly unlikely to be dishonesty or fraud or or, or, or or lack of application so you know the the number of people of working age disability and ill health benefits has gone up by almost two-thirds since the pandemic and as Ash just pointed out maybe the point there is oh I wonder whether the pandemic has had anything to do with this rather than thinking there's far too many people who are getting diagnosed with conditions that should not be excluding them from work but hey Tory's going to Tory. It's 12.33. Tim Humphrey has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.36 is the time. It takes the Telegraph three paragraphs. It's the first line of the third paragraph to tell us about how many people are economically inactive. Without adding, of course, that that is not the number of people that are um, claiming sickness benefit or who are signed off sick. Why, why would they include a figure that is not relevant to the story that they're describing unless they're trying to create the idea in our minds that the problem is much bigger than it really is? And ignore the fact that the problem might be really, really big because it's a really, really big problem. As in, there are lots of people signed off sick because... And stay with me on this one because it's fairly left-field thinking... There's lots of people signed off sick because there's lots of people sick. I'm going to read you something which cuts to the heart of it and reminds you that not everybody who is economically inactive is claiming. That's the true cruelty of this policy, James. Even as a non-claiming, invisible crazy, that's the word that they've chosen to use, we crazies already believe in our bones that we're a problem. Thanks, though, Rishi, for standing outside my house with a megaphone and telling the whole country just how useless and unproductive we are. Such burdens to the nation. Cheers for the reinforcement. That's what he's done today. I'm cautiously optimistic that it will be about as successful as everything else he's done as Prime Minister. Um, and he, he, up to and including, not even providing the, 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 the sort of red meat for the tabloids that um, he is clearly intending to provide. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you must have misheard the news bulletin there. You, you, you must have misheard. There's no earthly way that Boris Johnson would have breached UK government rules on a point. Not Boris Johnson. Not Boris pure as the driven snow Johnson, not Boris, I've never broken a rule in my life, folks, Johnson, not Boris, paragon of integrity, professionalism and accountability, Johnson, breaking government rules with his reputation, 
Surely not. Henry Riley, tell me it. Tell me it's not true. Well, James, I come bearing that news, um, I'm afraid. Mr Johnson has broken the rules in the past. These are the ACOBA rules, which is the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, effectively the government watchdog that looks at what ministers and ex-prime ministers do when they leave office. And, I mean, in the past he's got in trouble because, um, he, I mean, in July last year, the committee ruled that he had committed a clear breach with his column in the Daily Mail, which they say wasn't declared to them when he was Foreign Secretary. He also got in trouble um, with regards to an appointment with the Telegraph. This time though the committee have put it in black and white again that he has breached the rules. Now what does this relate to James? It relates to February when you may have seen in the media reports that Boris Johnson met with the Venezuelan president Nicolas Maduro. Mm. Now the meeting was alongside a man and organised by Martin Peterman who's the co-founder of Merlin Advisors. They are a hedge fund oh. um, in case you're interested. What's interesting, though, James, is that the concern here is that Boris Johnson in September of last year made an approach to the committee saying, I may well take up work with this company. Can you check that everything's fine and that I can do so? They were looking into it. He then withdrew that application. So the committee were under the impression that he was not going to be working with this company at all. However, they've only learned about this through media reports, James, that Boris Johnson's meeting with the Venezuelan president was organised with some involvement, they believe, with this particular company, given who was there. Boris Johnson, though, says, well, this is unpaid, and so therefore it's different. It's not different. No. If it's Even if it's unpaid, you still have to declare well, if it. If they pay for your flight or something like that, then it's a benefit in kind. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's the issue. Who, who actually paid for the physical trip, even if there was no payment that necessarily went uh, um, as a sort of remuneration? Now, the committee itself, James, can't be accused of being a sort of witch hunt. It's chaired by Lord Pickles, who's the former Conservative chairman, mm-hmm. former cabinet minister. Well, and the David- so you say, but, but I'm well, sure Nadine Dorries will be happy to describe it as a witch hunt, regardless of how much evidence there is that it isn't. Potentially. Um, I, yes, I was just pointing out, obviously, the same the same side. Um, you should have uh, said sensible people Sen- couldn't <laughs> describe, could never describe this as a witch hunt, um, or some, some word like that, sane. If um, you If you read the interactions, James, they're scathing with Lord Pickles and Boris Johnson. He says, Boris Johnson has lacked candour. He's been evasive. He's misled the committee. Um, He says Boris Johnson's lack of coordination is sufficient to report that he has breached government rules. He's been evasive. He's avoided answering specific questions. They say they've repeatedly asked Mr Johnson, dating back to last month, to clarify what his relationship is with this particular hedge fund. Mm. Um, Also, what is interesting to note, uh, Boris Johnson in response, a spokesperson, did not comment. They uh, made it clear they would not be commenting on this. But in sum, it's a breach. What I thought was particularly interesting, James, is um, Lord Pickles, who I think is slightly exasperated by the whole thing because he chairs this body that doesn't really have any power. He's now written to the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, to tell him that the rules have been breached. Um, I thought this line in his letter to Oliver Dowden was quite telling. In the meantime, as owner of the rules, what action to take in relation to the breach is a matter for you, the government, given the rules no longer seem to have relevance in the modern world and are unenforceable to applicants, determined to ignore them. There's little action you can take other than to acknowledge that there has been a breach. So Lord Pickles pointing out there's been a breach. Whether there is a consequence, though, I think remains to be seen. Well, well, I mean, we probably can say with some confidence that there won't be much. I mean, Lord Pickles doesn't seem to think there'll be much consequence. No, and I mean, he's frustrated, James, because in July July of last year, 2023, the government promised that there would be reforms to ACOBA, and he was led to believe that it would involve um, some sort of sanctions. Now, of course, he wouldn't unilaterally set what they are, but he could advise that Boris Johnson be prevented from, if he, if this um, is proven to, to have any um, intention that's not right, he, he could advise a, a sanction. That currently is not the case. So you, you can tell by his letter there, um, it's he's currently without a lot of tools in his armoury in order to, yeah. to really enforce this. Um, I, I've got one. Is that your story? Did you dig that one out yourself? No, well, I was, I, was, I was quick on it, but it wasn't well done. One. I've got one for you that you might not have come across. What, which other former Prime Minister is in trouble today? Ah, is this Liz Truss and her book? Yes, it is. Ah, I did read this. You're testing me now. This is, there's two things. She, the Cabinet Office didn't fully sign it off, I believe. They, mm-hmm. were, they were informed, but they didn't fully sign it off. And she's had to apologise um, beca- because of a reference. Oh, I'm getting close, aren't no, I? No, you're very um, good. It's very good, isn't he? What is it? It's, it's very good. They, they, it's going to be retracted from the e-book, but I can't quite remember what the reference is. Well, I, I can tell you what the British 
well, the Board of Deputies of British Jews have to say about Liz Truss's book. Okay. They say, we have written to Bite Back Publishing regarding a fabricated quote attributed to Mayor Amschel Rothschild being used in 10 years to save the West. That is the name of Liz Truss's book. Um, I, I, the, 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 the reason is that um, it's, it's a made-up quote widely regarded as, uh, as an anti-Semitic trope. And indeed, it was made up by a notorious anti-Semite. They have promised that it will be removed in the ebook version and in any future print editions of the book, which is a little optimistic in my humble <laughs> opinion. Uh, they add, we, we thank them for their swift response. So a, a made up anti-Semitic quote mm -hmm. in this book, which of course was published by Biteback, which is owned by... Is it, oh, I was going to say a name, but uh, I don't know if it's right, so I need to be careful. Is it a, a peer, it's a it's not, it's not peer of the It's realm. not libelous to say that it's owned by Lord Ashcroft. Ashcroft, the, right. The, I, was, I did think The alleged him, author of the book in which Angela Rayner's tax arrangements regarding the sale of her former council house uh, nearly a decade ago um, uh, first appeared. So I, I, what a tangled web we weave, eh? Do. Prime Minister's in trouble every hour. Try two of them, honestly, like buses. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Henry Riley. It's 12.45. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, David Batley's not very happy with me about putting that person in Idiot's Corner earlier for being the stupidest person listening to the programme today. Dave is adamant that he is the stupidest person <laughs> listening to the programme today. <laughs> <laughs> and he adds, I am Spartacus. And to prove his point, he spelled Spartacus incorrectly. Um, thank you, Dave. That made me chuckle during the break. And then I've got the problem sometimes of not knowing that the whether or not a text is a, a genuine attempt to get into Idiot's Corner or um, actually quite, quite a funny joke. Um, uh, uh, someone has texted to say, forget about Boris Johnson. Why don't we investigate Angela Rayner? Which I presume is a joke. Because the police are investigating Angela right now. <laughs> so if it's not a joke, it's straight into Idiot's Corner with you. Um, let's take a quick call and then, then I've got a bit of a special full disclosure this week that I want to tell you about at, at, at some length. So uh, with what might be the last word on Rishi Sunak pretending that there's such a thing as sick note culture, Erin is in Loughton. Erin, what would you like to say? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm so angry and upset. I'm shaking. Oh. At least I pray that this doesn't go ahead because I'm a mental health sufferer as well as I have um, I have um, stage three kidney disease that I've got to wait six months for a um, appointment at the hospital under the Pacific Clinic. Anyway, going back to yeah, sorry, I'm just. Don't you don't apologise to me. You take the drive. <laughs> yes, you take so your basically, time. Basically, how hard is it to get? Tell me how hard it is to right, get signed um, off. So, I, so yeah. I, so I care. I, I'm a carer for my two disabled boys. Um, so I don't work at the moment. But before I was work, before I did become a carer, I was working full time. I suffered with mental health for. Gosh, 25, 30 years now. Right. Um, it's not something I can control. I have bad days, I have better days. Of course. Some days I even struggle to get out of bed. Luckily, I don't have to go into work, but I still have to attend my boys. So effectively, yes. I'm still working. I still have to crawl. And Would get it out help? Of bed. Would it help if we sent Rishi Sunak around your house to shout, get up, oh, get up, get out of you, bed at you, you know every what? morning? What? I would love him to come to my house and just be in my household for two weeks. So going back to the sick note, I, 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 if it goes ahead, they will have death on their hands. Good Lord. Basically, it, it's going back to mental health, yes. you cannot wait. There will be a delay from the GP to give you a sick note to the to the DWP. Yeah. If you suffer with mental health, or you'll have, or you'll, or if, if it starts and you don't know what's going on, and you can't get signed off, I've had I've had friends that have took their own lives. I've had several friends that have took their own lives. Unfortunately, my dad tried to take his own life last year oh. and ended up in intensive care. And because they're not it, getting, because, in because part, not, there's never a single reason, enough, is there? But, but, but people aren't getting the help that they yeah, need. Yeah, it's 
try and make they all ha- they all work in companies. It's not about getting the help they need. They, that is about it. Don't get me wrong. Yes. But if this goes ahead, there's going to even be more suicide. Well, uh, well we can all we can all hope not, can't we? But but you know of what you speak, will. and you speak clearly from a position of both experience and knowledge. And and I would like to say I don't want you to be unduly alarmed about this. It, it, you know. But I can't because the, the detail seems to be lacking. The, the, the mission seems to be built upon prejudice and the consequences seem to be uncalculated. But I, but I wish you and your boys well. And I remind anybody listening who's been affected by any of the issues that, that Erin touched upon that Samaritans uh, is available to, to talk to you. 24 hours a day, seven days a week on 116123. And if, if you go to the website, if you go to Samaritans.org, you can see there are other ways of contacting them. Um, Kath's very unhappy. She says, James, your weatherman just said it was dry and sunny. It's pouring in Peckham. Kath, I'm so sorry. If you if you send me your receipt, I'll ensure you get a full refund. 12.52 is the time. This week's guest on Full Disclosure is Basim Youssef, who you, you may have heard of. He's gone absolutely bonkers on social media but before that even happened he was named as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by time magazine he's an egyptian comedian television host and surgeon the last bit i didn't know i've seen some of his clips on social media um and some of his work with john stewart in america i didn't know he used to be a surgeon so when he came in because he's on tour in this country now when he came in to talk to me about his life I, I was most interested in, in when he began to make the crossover from surgeon, actual surgeon, to, um, well, what he is today, which is a, a sort of curious mixture of, of, of comedian, political commentator and television host. It just seemed to me to be a really odd leap. I was middle class. I didn't really have many complaints, but I think that my country deserved better. Uh, mm. You don't really have to be on the worst possible socioeconomic level in order to revolt about against a, a certain of course. type. And also, it doesn't have to be revolting by marching the streets and throwing rocks. You can simply revolt about like how your elections are being handled or who's buying your election or who's controlling the election, even if we are in a democratic first world country, because there's a lot of that to be discussed about that, mm. right? You don't have to be a dictatorship in order to have your decisions and your and and your uh, say in deciding your future to be taken away from you because uh we talk a lot about the dictatorship in the middle east we talk about about like the lack of transparency and accountability but we don't what we don't talk about for example american election is like how the american elections is bought and sold for lobbies of special interests, whether they were domestic lobbies or do- lobbies that work for the special interests of a foreign country, especially if it's a country that we fund, it's a client state. So this is this is the kind of things that, like you know, uh, revo- revolting against a certain status quo doesn't really need to have to be violence from the streets. So you don't you don't, I mean, partly because of your perspective, your personal perspective, you, you've got you're not under any illusions about the Western democratic model being good and middle eastern dictatorships being bad you see i mean i see i see a lot of potential in the western democratic model i think there's a lot of hope but it the, what we have is an idea a very flashy idea that is in yeah. uh, that in reality has been uh sabotaged uh i mean the, because you end up going to, to to have all of these promotions and all of these encouragement to go vote Mm. And we go vote for a certain candidate. And then that candidate do, uh, end up, when they succeed, when they when they go through the primaries or the, the elections, when they win the elections, they don't really represent your special in- interest, mm. the voter. They represent the people who give them the most money for their next campaign, for the next election cycle, which is pharmaceutical countries uh, or in the military industrial complex or the NRA or the APAC. I didn't vote for that. And so that was about the Arab Spring, I should have mentioned, when he sort of went down to the protest about the Arab Spring and uh, started treating people who were being injured and realised that the story being told to the Egyptian public and the rest of the world was completely at odds with what he was seeing at the ground. The odd bit is, and the bit that launched his career as, as, as one of the um, biggest voices now in, 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 in America, it, it was that they started making funny clips. That's it. They just, he just started doing funny clips, which I, I found equally fascinating. 
after the revolution, after the first few weeks, there was like a, a sense or a state of fluidity. Of course. Anything yes. can happen. Yes. There's kind of dreams. And so people were just like putting uh, their dreams up there. Yeah. There are a lot of people like put content even before me. And it was just like, this is what happens when you have this like sense of freedom. You put dreams out there. And it just happened that I was lucky that mine, got, people got hooked to it. Des describe it for people who haven't seen it or for people who can't understand. Well, it was, it was a five minutes uh, t like TV episodes on YouTube, t 2011, very early in the YouTube days. And I basically kind of like, took the the state-run media clips and I made fun of it like John Stewart does with his shows and people it resonated with people and it just exploded went viral and then suddenly I am being offered my first television show it's hard for people to understand that it uh, what revolutionary comedy or commentary is if you've grown up here or in America because what what was happening I think was that people had never seen that before in a you might be able to take the mickey behind closed doors but as you would discover later with, with the, the, the man that came after Mubarak, um, th this would have been sedition, what you were doing. Uh, well, uh, a year uh, previously. Yeah, yeah not, uh, not a year, only a few weeks. Well, of course, yes. Yeah. Of course. Uh, and, uh, so it's got the thrill of the unknown and the, oh my gosh, I can't believe that someone's doing this. It's yes, part of the process. Yes, it is, uh, again, that's why it's resonated with a lot of people. Mm. Uh, people just like found what they always dreamed of kind of, you know, materialize in front of them. I'm interested. I won't dwell on this unduly, but I'm I'm interested in the 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 the, the sort of duality here. The idea that you were quietly getting on with your life as a surgeon. You were you were satisfied. You 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 know you had aspirations, either geographically as much as anything else, to be somewhere else. But you weren't living a life of anger. You weren't in a garret writing furious tracts no. against the government. or no. And yet when the planets aligned, when the moment presented itself, you found yourself perfectly positioned to... It doesn't... I I, I think I was inspired by the, the satirical commentary of John Stewart because okay. for me, I was watching it for years and yes. I wonder if we'll ever have it in Egypt, how it would, would, uh, how it would look like. Okay. So it wasn't like... A more of a passion of the politics, but it was more uh, of a passion of the art. Yes. Okay. Of the uh, and this is why I didn't actually go in with anger. Yeah. I went in it with like I like that kind of model of comedy. I wish I can replicate it. So it so was the material is secondary to the style. It's 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 maybe I, mean, yes. I know it needs to be about politics and gov and news, but actually you're an enthusiast for the for the medium. Yes, but the style is everything. Of yes, exactly. The right. style is everything, right? Because you can choose to be a go in at a style of anger yeah. of uh, of uh, of you know uh, rallying people or you can just like choose, choose comedy which i think it's more difficult and it's more uh, sensitive but also very it is difficult actually so so when you're saying that you're not when you say that when you insist that you're not an activist in a way what you're saying is that you're not a polemicist i don't know what that is but where you're not a a, a, a kind of a polemicist is the professionally angry person oh is which that can it? also be comedy Yes. But, uh, you know, well, but, you can you can be angry about things while do be doing comedic stuff. Of but, course. But I think it's. But you're not coming at it from that angle. Yeah, I I, I don't think so. Uh, Basim Yusuf, the guest on this week's Full Disclosure, and it is a big conversation that which I I I really would love you to have a listen to. Get it from Global Player, of course, where you can also rewind and pause live radio, the official LBC app. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.